Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take this. Okay, it's um, 1829. And the 16th of September, and this is the meeting for uh, Communities Environment Partnerships, Phase of Stoke and Dean. Uh, members have been encouraged to obtain any points on clarification on reports on the agenda in advance of the meeting. Public uh, Members of the public will be invited to speak at the relevant item. Uh, I've got a bit of, uh, of, of reading to do. So I am Councillor Gaskell, the Chair of Community Environment Partnerships Committee. And I would like to welcome everyone to the meeting, which is being held virtually and in accordance with the Council's rules on virtual meetings which reflect the recent published government regulations. The meeting is streamed live on YouTube and will be available to view after the meeting is finished. Councillors who sit on this committee are identified by name on the screen and I will introduce officers by name before they address the committee. Councillors are reminded that although this meeting is being held remotely, they are regarded as being present in a meeting of the council and they should observe the normal rules of behaviour under the member code and conduct and not allow members of the, the household to distract them during the course of the meeting. Can members ensure that the mobile phones are now switched off and are, and are silent? Members of the committee will turn on their video link during the meeting and keep the microphones muted unless they have been invited to speak by myself as chair. Members are reminded that if they wish to switch off the video link or move away from the camera, they will be treated as leaving the meeting and will not be able to take part in any vote taken on their item on the item under discussion. Members can indicate their wish to speak by raising their hand and should only speak when I, as chair, invite them to do so. The officers present will only switch the video link on during the item that they are presenting or were they wish to be invited to speak by me as chair. As chair, I will confirm the name of any visiting speakers at the appropriate time in the agenda who will address the committee by audio. Councillors should declare that they have, are leaving the meeting and switch off their video link if they have a disclosable pecuniary interest or other personal interest in the item on the agenda. The councillors can switch on the video link when I call the next agenda item. Voting will be taken by roll call and I will confirm the recommendation proposed to the committee before the voting begins. Can each member indicate whether they are, are for or against the recommendation or whether they wish to abstain? Hopefully we will not have any IT problems but can I remind councillors that if the connection is lost, that they should immediately advise democratic support officer and use the remote link to access the meeting again. So item one on the agenda is apologies for absence and substitutions. So we have uh, Councillor Jones is replaced by Councillor McCormick. Are there any apologies for absence or substitutions? I'll take that as a no. Uh, can I also welcome Councillor Still, uh, who's our new member onto the group. Item two, declara declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Take that as a no. I'll move on to item three. Urgent matters. Are there any urgent matters? So I'll just read out, it says to consider any items of business other than those shown on the agenda and which by reason of special circumstances to be stated at the meeting in opinion of the chairman should be considered at the meeting as a matter of urgency. So I'll, I'll take that as no. Item four, minutes of the meeting held on the 24th of June. Are the committee happy that the minutes of the meeting held on the 24th of June 2020 are accurate record. Is that agreed? Yeah? Okay. So um, I'll, I'll arrange with Ellie and sign off those as, um, as agreed. Item five. 
where I can get some background noise then. I just wondered if anyone wanted me. So item five, referral from the council libraries. So this was proposed by Councillor Watts and second, seconded by Councillor Grant. This council resolves to work with the Hampshire County Council to save any of the libraries in the borough of Basingstoke and Dean at risk of closure. Libraries are a valuable community asset whose value cannot be measured in monetary money alone. In addition to the traditional book service, there are newer services such as online access, which are a lifeline for our most vulnerable residents. There is also scope to broaden the service available at the libraries and involve multiple voluntary and charity, charity organisations to provide these. This council also re resolves to identify the use of libraries and other community facilities for activities they are not currently used for, such as remote working, health and education outreach, and ad identifying suitable partners to help bring this about. So we as a committee um, need to agree uh, how they wish to, how we wish to proceed with the recommendation. We can either agree to, to, to request a report back, set up a task and finish group instead, or refer to another committee. Can I open that to uh, discussion? I can't see anybody wanting to uh, discuss. Okay, Councillor Cousins. Thank you, Chair. I'm not really sure what we can do now because the decision by Hampshire County Council has been made of which libraries they intend to keep and which ones they intend to close. So I'm not sure what further work could be done. There is a statement about uh, community groups. Um, and I just wondered if, uh, if, if we had any, any sort of involvement in any of those community groups. No. Okay. Uh, well, we, we've got to decide whether we want to report a committee. Hang on, Chair. I have my hand up. Sorry? I have my hand up. Councillor Regan. Okay. So, sorry, Councillor Regan. I I'll use the buttons if you right, raise your hand. I'm, do, I'm using the technology. Uh, yeah. It is raised. I appreciate that. But I think it said in the notes I've just read out that you need to raise your hand. Problem I just is, did electronically. Problem is, I can only see your ear. I have to sit close because I can't see the screen. I have poor eyesight. No worries. Councillor Regan, what would you like to say? Well, uh, uh, in contrast to what Councillor Cousins was saying, we are working closely with South Ham Library, which is to close, unfortunately, due to austerity cuts. And uh, we, we as small councillors uh, are working closely with the uh, community association who put an expression of interest to take it over as part of, as a community group. And uh, so there, that is a way, a way forward. And also we'll be looking for help for the, for the council somewhere along the road because you can't allow a community association to go to the wall. And this is a way forward to use the space. There's a big space, South Ham Library, so we get the, they've got to put forward a business plan and the closing date's the 30th of September. So this, this is not going to go away. So we are working hard. Okay, so, so how would you recommend we move forward with this within the Borough Council? Have a task and finish group. Is everybody happy with that approach? Yeah. Okay, can you raise your hands if you are? Can you see me? Yep. Okay, that's you know, and so so we'll set up a task and finish group. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. So, uh, item six: referral from the council on COVID nineteen. So, um, a, a retrospective analysis of the crisis uh, is conducted by the scrutiny committee with a view to learning lessons and sharing best practice in case of a second wave later this year. I, yeah. think, that, I think that's probably on top onto us now, isn't it? With possible input to feed into a, a future public inquiry. The motion was amended, which was agreed to, to also refer to CPE items related to support 
for our communities and building Claire? Camp. yeah um back on the um libraries motion did the committee want to agree whether they wanted to put some representatives forward for that task and finish group good point thank you ali so would we like any representatives if you'd raise your hands if you're if you're interested so just bear with me so i've got councillor kim taylor sorry could you write these down um ellie councillor regan anybody else and and I, and I guess we'll we'll get back to you ellie for any anybody else from other parties so back to item six the, the committee needs to agree how we wish to proceed with a recommendation. They can agree to request a report back, set up a task and finish group instead, or refer to another committee. However, I would suggest that unless there is a specific issue that the committee wants to address regarding the motion, they wait for the outcome of the scrutiny as they're conducting a review and possible strands from that review may then be directed to CEP. The motion could be noted for the time being and included on the committee's work programme to be scheduled later this year. After the scrutiny outcome. Um, but as part of that, I have been in touch with Basingstoke Voluntary Group. We are very lucky to have Councillor Capon, who is... Um, who is the chief executive of BVA and he's given me something to to read to the group so following on from our conversation yesterday evening here are a few update bullet points on the BVA regarding agenda item at this evening's CEP committee on the coronavirus response BVA continue to manage a cent central coronavirus coronavirus outline in partnership with BDVBC with the two teams working closely to ensure capacity can be scaled up and down according to demand. This helpline, which accepts referrals both directly from the public as well as from Hampshire County Council helpline, will continue until at least January, with, view, with review towards longer were needed. The 25 plus community hubs that were operating across the borough have now, for the most part, been stood down. However, BVA are continuing to, to liaise with the hub leaders as part of the Community, community Connections Network initiative, which aims to utilise the connectivity and neighbourliness of shown during lockdown to ensure residents can be signposted to their nearest connector for help or support in their neighbourhoods. This network also reserves a shadow hub network in case of a second lockdown and the need to escalate support back up again. An inaugural Community Connections Network meeting bringing together all the hub, local hub leaders and stakeholders who played a part in responding to the pandemic from a community perspective will facilitate by BVA on Wednesday the 7th of October in order to capture feedback around lessons learned and readiness for any future lockdowns. I hope the, book, the above is useful. So can I, can I first publicly thank um, Councillor Capon and all the uh, volunteers in the BVA for their, for their uh, work during this, this lockdown period. And uh, Ellie, I'll send you a copy of that email so you can add that to the minutes. So if I go back to what we need to do, um, so we need to decide uh, whether we want to uh, wait for the, well, I suggest we wait for the scrutiny. So shall we shall we just put that forward or back until we, we receive something from scrutiny? Can we agree on that? Can you raise your hands if you agree? Um, could I ask a question first? Uh, certainly, yeah. Sorry, Councillor uh, Vaux. Um, do you know if the analysis uh, to be conducted by scrutiny will include uh, engagement with the community hubs so that uh, the learning from the community hubs will be part of it. Um, I, I appreciate you've, you've got um, that report from the um, from um, Spotlight, the hub. 
Um, but there's, there was an awful lot that went on in the community in, in, at parish level where there are parishes and all sorts of things. So I would, it would be a shame to miss that being involved in the scrutiny report. And how do you propose we take that forward? Well, can we ask scrutiny if, if they are including uh, specific engagement? Because what's written here is is quite vague. It's with a view to learning lessons and sharing best practice. Well, it doesn't say whether that's about how the internal part of the council worked um, and ex external community stuff or not. Because if if there if it isn't about the community, I think we should be thinking about doing something ourselves to make sure that we learned the lessons this time because it did take a little while to get it all up and running um, in the, in our communities. Uh, there were, you know, there were patches where it got up really, really quickly and other areas where there wasn't a natural center um, that picked it up. So I think there is learning to be had. Yeah. And we've, we've got this, well, there's, there is a meeting on the 7th of October what the scrutiny meeting? It's not. No, this is the BVA meeting. A BVA meeting. You know, so, I mean, BVA is, is is great, but it it's not. You know, that BVA have have bit, are an umbrella, which is fine. But I think we should be asking in the some of the individual hubs. You know, like in Tadley, there's two or three different elements to what went on. Um, different parts of the community took on different elements of support that was required. It, it, it's not straightforward. No, I, and I'm trying to think, because I mean, I, I set things up in my parish and um, the BVA were on to me to sort of say, could you communicate with us? But to be honest, I didn't have that much going on, to be honest, um, so I, I didn't bother. Um, but, that, but that's kind of my point, you see, because some folk, they really got involved with the BVA. Others, they got on with it themselves um, and, really only went to the BVA for uh, funding because a lot of the council funding was was streamed through the BVA which was fantastic but but you see what I mean I mean different communities need a different support okay uh, Ian you got your hand raised could you reply to that yeah and, and apologies for the, uh, the the through traffic behind me and <laughs> yeah. working um, I suppose my suggestion would be that I ask Daniel Garnier who's one of the officers who led on working with BVA to, um, to use BVA to seek um, some feedback from the groups. Um, BVA did actually maintain a mm -hmm. weekly dialogue with all of the groups that were registered, which we asked all groups to do. And we're taking feedback from all groups on um, the extent to which volunteer activity was happening within individual groups and in individual areas, what sort of support they might um, need further, either in terms of funding or clarity or escalation where there were issues that they couldn't necessarily cover themselves. So I think, Councillor, um, the suggestion is, is very good to get the feedback from those groups as part of a lessons learned exercise. Uh, and I see no reason why we couldn't incorporate that into the findings on the report that goes back to scrutiny. Thank okay. you. So, so uh, shall I propose that we, we wait for that information to come back from scrutiny and uh, we re-adjourn mm -hmm. this, this item for, for a, a future meeting? Um, Sorry, Councillor Taylor. Oh, sorry, Councillor Taylor. You're in the top corner of my um, my, my PC. I can't see you. Sorry. Would you like to speak? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, I've been like uh, Councillor Regan using the electronic hand waving facility. So you might have to have your participant list um, uh, showing to to see us there. Um, I mean, to an extent, I agree that we need to be dependent upon what comes out of scrutiny. But at the moment, we don't know what that will be. And time is pushing on. And there are some elements that we might uh, want to consider um, as well ourselves, particularly in relation to, to communities. Um, 
I, I, I'm not sure where the officer's presentation has got to, because on the agenda for scrutiny, it just says presentation to follow on, on this particular uh, issue. So I'm not sure I would be happy for us just to say, let's leave this until something comes out of scrutiny, because that could still take quite some time and there are elements of community issues which um, Councillor Vaux for example has already uh, identified about you know whether or not what we were doing and the feedback from the local community groups is sufficient because we might need to pile in more money or more energy but also there are other some other community elements uh, for example around um, issues like how are we engaging with BAME communities and making sure that things are going out in different languages uh, and those sorts of things, you know, or disabled people making sure that there are, are there deaf broadcasts for people to understand what it is they should be doing. So there are other community issues and areas that might not come under the scrutiny element and we don't know, but I think that we can't just keep waiting so maybe we just defer this to the next meeting the next agenda so we know where we are uh, uh sorry ian, ian ball um when it when is the next scrutiny meeting next week next week so tuesday <laughs> right so it's, it makes sense to just move it on to the next uh, next meeting is everybody happy with that Sorry, Council McCormick. Uh, I'm, I'm, ha I'm reasonably happy to do that. I, I just think the, the committee needs to be aware of the fact that, yes, the scrutiny committee will be asking questions, and there's some fairly fundamental questions we could be asking, um, like, um, well, in, in terms of scrutiny remit, you know, why was it done the way it was with the approach to BVA? Um, from our point of view, with the communities, we've already touched on the fact that there were seems to be a non-uniform way um, help was rolled out across communities and I think it's incumbent on us to um, establish what links were there in the community and certainly in, in my ward and the adjacent wards there were community centres offered up some were used some were not um, there were uh, it was thrown together admittedly very quickly given the urgency at the time um, but I think there will be lessons learned and we could look at that not having to wait for scrutiny. I wouldn't want us to be operating completely in series with the scrutiny committee. I think there are aspects of it that can be done in parallel as well. And um, it's certainly in terms of building council resilience. I mean, the big question is, as a council, um, what more could we have done, especially when you consider that in the not too distant future we might be having to do a local test track and trace or we might be having a local lockdown so i think we need to be aware of those things as a committee and start asking the right questions so so do we need to get information to scrutiny for them to discuss is that what you're saying I think it's really more incumbent on the scrutiny committee to ask for that information. We can't second guess what it is they require, um, but I think we should be ready for that. Um, but I, I see the, the resilience and the um, community support as being separate activities from scrutiny. Um, the, the council motion is, you know, very wide ranging. It's, it's, it's not for us to to, to question what it was saying because we all voted for it on the night but um i think certainly they're parallel activities and we should bear that in mind um i appreciate that there may be things coming out of scrutiny that we need to feed into but I, at the same time i don't think we should have everything completely in series with the scrutiny committee because that work might take months and that's time that we don't have with a very rapidly changing picture with covid but, but would you agree we still need to wait till the, the first meeting, which is next week of the scrutiny meeting, before we start to discuss and, and move forward ourselves? Um, yeah, I mean, it's only it's only a week, but then when are we going to meet next? I mean, um, we, we haven't got a meeting for quite a while, have we? I thought there was one in uh, October. One sec. 21st of October, so that's a, yeah. a month's time. 
Yeah, so just over a month. Is that acceptable? I mean, the thing is, we, we've not got anything now to, to discuss, have we? That's a problem. So, um, so we, we've got to wait for that and maybe come up with our own agenda items in that period. So can, can I, shall I, shall I refer it to, uh, to the 21st of October meeting? I think we've got a majority in favour, Chair. Yeah, OK. Um, Councillor Regan, you have got your hand up electronically. Did, did you want to say anything before we move on? Uh, no, it's all been said now, Chair. Thank you. All right, thank you. Right, so I'll move on to item seven, uh, which is Basin Stoke Town Community Football Club. So, um, contact officer is uh, Helen Taylor Cobb. But, um, well, the purpose of this meeting is to, is to respond to a series of, of questions raised at CEP meeting on 24th of June 2020 regarding support for Basin Stoke Town Community Football Club. So can I ask uh, Councillor Bean to introduce this item? Um, the relevant officers for this item are Helen Taylor Cobb and Mark, Paul Martin and Fiona Thompson. Is Councillor Bean here? I am, um, yeah, can you see me? Just make sure I've turned it on properly. Uh, yeah, got you. Um, so thank you um, and good evening. So the paper before you this evening responds to a number of questions raised at the CEP meeting in June regarding support for Basingstoke Town Community Football Club. Um, we have been working collaboratively with the club and Hans FA for several years in order to find a solution to allow the club to return home and play football within the borough. Significant progress has now been made to enable this to happen and the upgrades to Winklebury Football Complex to improve the facility to ground grading D requirements is nearing completion, which will finally see the town, the community football club return back to Basingstoke. This is after they were left without a home, an outcome which we have worked tirelessly hard to achieve with both the club and Hans FA. We do, however, have to be very mindful of the fact that there is currently a live planning application on the Camro site which is yet to be determined and deals with the loss of the level C facility at the Camrose. That is not something that we can or will be discussing this evening as that, that is a matter for the planning committee. Great progress has now been made to achieve the outcome of Basingstoke Town Community Club returning home to play football and for clubs and residents to be able to enjoy the improved facilities at Winklebury. We're very proud of our track record in investing in sports and leisure and working with clubs to support them in achieving their ambitions. Winklebury is nearing completion, but we absolutely recognise the club's desire to future plan. This is why we met with the club only on Friday last week to continue dialogue, as we have for a long time around how we can support them in their ambitions. It is absolutely vital now that the club have a voice in feeding into the leisure and recreational needs assessment, which is about to be kicked off shortly. This is an opportunity they were not afforded last time as they were a private club. This will enable them to, alongside all other clubs, have a voice in future needs and provides a robust evidence base to demonstrate what the future demand and need looks like. In summary, I want to thank all involved, officers, the club and Hans FA in working tirelessly to bring the club back to Basingstoke, an achievement I think we should all reflect on positively. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bean. So we, we have um, a guest speaker. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Steve Williams to speak. Hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, can I remind you, uh, you, you've got two minutes and, um, and when you're ready, we'll start. Okay, recently C Councillor Bean expressed welcome support for BTC's aspirations and we appreciate it of all the work that's gone on to date. But we just ask that two points are taken into consideration in that context. First, we need to keep in view the 58K that the community club financed by a loan to undertake community works at Winklebury. Essentially, this should be a matter for Basron, but I just think we need to keep it in view. 
because it shouldn't be a millstone around the club's neck. Secondly, in relation to our request, uh, the council refused to undertake a review of four sites that we've identified. We think it would be prudent looking at long-term matters and recognizing limitations, which I'm happy to go into if asked questions regarding the Winklebury site to look at what can be offered by other sites. Those two sites were Downgrange, Many Down, and two sites in ownership of Hans County Council, that part of Downgrange bordering the A30 and the Gypsy site up towards the motorway junction. So we just think it's prudent in terms of long-term planning to actually undertake that. And we would welcome uh, the council reviewing that position and maybe looking at a cross-party group that could look at this and have fresh terms of reference rather than relying on old roofs reviews that were taken place in 2015. The community club is very different from the club that Razak ruled when, when the previous reviews were undertaken. Time's almost up. I've stopped. Excellent, thanks very much for that. Um, can, can I also acknowledge that um, I did receive an email as an update from, from uh, Basingstoke Town Community Football Club from Kevin White, so thank you for that. Um, do we have any questions uh, from councillors uh, to officers or can we, in fact, first of all, can, can we have an officer to respond to, uh, to Mr White's uh, questions? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, committee members. Um, in respect to the two questions that have been put forward, um, I think the uh, position in respect of the uh, sums of money referred to are actually dealt with uh, within the paper. Um, I think there are item 7.1. Um, and um, in respect of the four sites that have been proposed, um, obviously we've got um, the mitigations that are going through next week. Um, I think it's important that we allow the planning process to follow due course. However, we have undertaken uh, in our meeting with the football club on Friday to continue to have structured meetings with them. Uh, proposed on a quarterly basis and I think using the uh, leisure and recreational needs assessment is a really good way for the club to articulate its aspirations for the future and for us to have that as a form of evidence base then that we can use moving forward for sports across the borough. Um, I don't know whether Councillor Bean had anything that she wanted to add to those points. Thank you Chair. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Helen. No, it's just really to reiterate, I think we've been quite clear in terms of the £58,000 investment that that was done without any, um, the council weren't aware of this, we, we weren't able to make any comment in terms of that, that investment. And in terms of looking at other sites, I think we absolutely at this point cannot be seen to be predetermining the outcome of the planning application next week. But what we have committed to do is work with the club in terms of its future aspirations and provided with them with the correct vehicle to enable them to um, help in terms of achieving those ambitions. And, you know, it's just not the appropriate time for us to be looking at sites. There is a live planning application at the moment. And I think just in context of £58,000 as well, I think we as a council also mindful of the financial position we're in ourselves in terms of COVID recovery from that and the potential of the second spike as well. So I'd just like to leave that thought with members too. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to open this up to, uh, to councillors. Uh, the first one I've got is uh, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, the question I have is in section 3.3 .3 of the paper, uh, references made to further works required to enable Winkbury facility to be graded at level C. Um, hard standing works to increase the cap capacity to 1,950 with potential for 3,000 persons 
and work to increase the seating capacity in terrace to 500 with 250 being seats. Now, the Winklebury ground, which is literally half a mile away from where I live, is a much smaller footprint than the Camrose ground. The Camrose ground had a, a stand that I think sat something like 600 people and um, a very full Camrose would be 2000 people. Um, I'm at a loss, can someone explain how we expect to get that number of people on the Winklebury site? That seems a, a way too many people for what that site could accommodate. And that's just having st seating and standing people on site. That doesn't also address the access issues with the site. I'm, I'm not really sure if we could answer that. I mean, have we got, I mean, it's a technical question, isn't it, really? Um, officers, do, do we have anybody who can answer that question? Hello, Chair. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, hi Paul, sorry. Uh, hi, uh, um, yeah, no problem. Sorry. So for part of the planning application, obviously the requirements were sent in for the Winklebury improvements to grade C and they were assessed by the Football Foundation and Sport England, um, which would have access to the national ground grading requirements. So obviously based on the footprint, technical drawings, etc., stands and everything else, it was deemed that it was capable to take the relevant number up to grades equivalent. Do you have a response to that, Council McCormick? Well, uh, Paul's just said it was deemed, but I, I want to understand the process of it because I, I can't see how that's possible. So, it, it, you know, that it was deemed sounds like somebody stuck a finger in the air, said, oh, yeah, these are the, these are um, example requirements. And, yeah, we're sure the ground can meet it, but I'm not sure it can. It's a smaller ground than the Camrose was. It doesn't have the same access requirements. Um, 3,000 people is a lot of people to get into that Winklebury site when you've only got 100 car parking spaces or less in, in the immediate vicinity. And you've got very limited pathway access and you've got very limited room on the site. To so how was that conclusion arrived at? Paul, would you like to respond to that? Uh, I can. So in essence, there's a green book requirements that sets out all the standard specifications. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact detail to it because it's more the ground grading requirements. As part of the planning application, they'll have to submit things like a travel plan and those kind of things, which will assess all the issues of parking, etc. Um, again, we weren't involved in that side of things. It was more the submission from cameras and assessed via the planning process. Is there any way we can find out that information? If it's been submitted to planning, have we got those documents? Yeah, all the information will be on the planning permission, uh, on the planning portal with regards to technical specifications and standards. Um, and the details should break it down within the, the information for it. Um, but again, I'm happy to take it away and try and find out what the details and requirements are for the ground grading. Sorry, I, Chair, um, I don't know if it's helpful, but on page... 26, sorry, sorry. this is Councillor Vaux. Um, there's spectator facilities for D level is on page 26 and it says uh, minimum accommodation required is 300. Right, we'll so, come back to that Councillor Vaux. Uh, sorry, Councillor Bean, you've got your hands frantically waving at me. I'm sorry, but I can ask you to speak. I'm oh, not frantically waving, I was just holding it up. No, um, obviously we, we can come back on the detail of Council McCormick's question, but I think it's also important in the context of Basing Stoke Town Community Club and playing at the Winklebury facility, I think we need to kind of bring this into context in terms of actually what are the average number of fans that come and watch the games and I, you know I don't have the exact numbers but I, I don't anticipate they are anywhere near close to the 3,000. I'm not saying um, in any way that in the future that that may not change, but I think we're probably a long way off that at the moment. So again, I just, in the context of where we are now and where we will likely be in the next few years, I don't think we'll hit anywhere near that number. And clearly we will continue conversations with the club in terms of their future ambitions and the growth of the club as well. 
Thank you. Uh, and Councillor Vaux, you, you just said that uh, for, for next season, there is only a requirement for 300 people. Yes, that's right. But to get to, uh, to D, um, if you then refer to page 19, point, para 3.3, it says in order to be graded at level C, there needs to increase the capacity to 1,950 with the potential for 3,000. And it, it, it says there that implies that it can be done. I absolutely understand Councillor McCormick's view about how. I mean, I, I haven't looked at the site. I've got absolutely no idea. I'm just going on what's in the report. OK. Right. Um, I've got um, Councillor Kim Taylor. Next. Thank, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, first, if I may, um, I don't know if we were able to have asked uh, questions of the guest speaker because we might have been able to ask him why uh, his organisation feels that Winklebury isn't suitable for uh, uplifting to, to um, grade C. Um, that might have been quite informative. I don't know if we can go back and do that at, at some point. Um, my question is really for clarification. I mean, I I totally understand and I don't want to put Councillor Bean in any kind of position because I know there's the forthcoming um, uh, planning application. So these are sort of possibly yes, no type answers. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, 3.2 uh, says that um, work is going ahead uh, to get things up to D, level D, but I'm not entirely clear who's paying for that and whether or not that cost is supposed to be included in the section 106. I mean, that might just be a yes, yes, no, it's in the 106 or it isn't. And then 3.3 talks about further works at Winklebury um, to get up to level C being in, in the, the section uh, 106. So I'm not clear whether, you know, to get to D, is that included as well or not? So, so I was un unclear what's in what is potentially proposed as that 106 whether it's the to get it to C and to get it to D or just to get it to C and then that links slightly to 5.4 uh, paragraph 5.4 where it suggests that, that the improvements in any event using the section 106 to get to C would only take place if the club was promoted. Now that led me into a question of well in that case would would we have to give them you know, money back or potentially not be getting the money if they didn't get promoted, even though the the what was the current ground was C and therefore C would be the the, the appropriate mitigation. So I, I'm just not very clear about what is being included, in, in, you know, in this section uh, 106 mitigation. Is it all the work needed to get to D plus the work needed to get to C? Um, I, that's the first part of my question. Depending upon the answer, I might have another one. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that wasn't just one question, Councillor Taylor. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think it's a good idea, probably. Uh, is Kevin White still here? It's Mr. Williams. I'll bring Mr. Williams back in now. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Sorry, uh, Mr. Williams. I, I was calling. Mr. White OK, I'll, I'll try and deal with uh, several of the points that have been raised in relation to the limitations of the Winklebury site, whilst we're actually it's a, a lifesaver, a lifeline for the club to come back there because of the grade D improvements being paid for by the council and the work that's already done, the infamous 58K, which I mentioned yet again. Uh, that was paid for by the community club. The limitations at Winklebury are that under the community terms of engagement or operating their usage, the club is league locked or capped up to grade C level, one level above grade D, when previously the club, as recently as 2016 at the Camrose, played at grade B level. So the club is concerned about that lock, league locking aspect. The second aspect that concerns our limitations are Winklebury is a very successful site. The bookings are oversubscribed. Quite rightly, the community club cannot have priority over any other bookings. And we're not able 
to make bookings for crucial development teams that part of our strategy is to develop local youngsters to play at a higher level. And playing at Winklebury in front of, with accommodation, would do much to ups, offset the high cost per game of running those more junior teams. So those are the two limitations. I think Councillor McCormack has hit on a very valid point when he's asking about 3,000 capacity at Winklebury. The grade C ground grading level specifies capacity of 1,950 with a potential to go to 3,000. And I think in, in the rush to look at whether grade C would be met in future by mitigations from the applicant for the Camrose planning, we consideration hasn't been given by any of the parties about whether the potential for 3000 can actually be readily met. Councillor McCormack is right in saying that Winklebury has a narrow footprint. The current stand capacity at Winklebury is 66. The, the covered stands and terraces that will go in will help bring up the capacity to 1,950, but there isn't, unless the site is expanded, in my view, space to actually make the jump to 3,000. And the risk is that if on the mitigations alone, it's assumed that grade C standard will be met, we shall, we shall be in, in shortage. Clearly the football club want the 3000 capacity to be judged by the official independent person who would do the assessment for the FA. But I do have serious concerns um, about meeting the 3000 capacity. Okay, can I just ask, have you seen the plans and, uh, and are the plans in a, in a fit state to, to make that judgment? The, the plans that were approved went forward in relation to the building. They were done by Bazron's agent under my name. They've gone forward and whilst they cover the structures, they do not cover any provision for 3,000 spectators. They're purely and simply concerned with 1,950 and that, that, that is met. And to be fair, whilst the car park at uh, Winklebury uh, covers 100 cars, then when the football club conducted a survey of fans, well over half said they would park in the leisure park and walk through under the underpass to the ground. And in fact, people thought it would be more convenient for arriving and leaving to watch matches to use the leisure park. So whether that aspect was taken into account by the planning officer, I'm not aware. Uh, a, a travel plan was produced and no questions were referred in relation to it. OK, thanks for that. Uh, can, I, can I pass that over to our officers to respond to? Hello, thank you, Chair, um, um, and thank you for uh, the comments. Um, I think I just want to be really cautious about discussing the mitigations that are on a live planning application. Um, so um, whilst I'm happy to address any questions, I'm just conscious of the fact that we are discussing the relative merits of mitigations that have been put forward in the planning application. Uh, can can we state though um, to, to to Mr Williams that you know that that discussion has got to be done during the planning application process, and and for him to put those points forward during that process? Yes, I don't. Uh, it, sorry. Sorry, I don't know whether you want me to come in there. I, I accept that, and I recognise that the the three thousand capacity point is 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 perhaps a point for the planning application. All I was trying to do was to clarify. I don't want to muddy the waters in any way, shape, or form at this meeting, or preempt what's the proper consideration of the development control committee. 
Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, um, w w sorry, w were any more questions, Councillor Taylor, involved in that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I mean, that, that dealt with first element, which was just asking um, our, our guest speaker why he felt that it, it wasn't uh, suitable for uh, level uh, C. Um, the other bits, I suppose, which are a bit yes, no, which I, I, I was trying to, to ask is, 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 the, is the cost of the works to get to D mentioned under paragraph 3.2, is that part of the proposed mitigations. I can see that 3.3 .3 is part of the proposed mitigations, but I was confused by what was said in paragraph 5.4, which suggested that that's only going to apply, or those mitigations would only be required, and I quote, if the club is promoted. So I really just wanted to know, and I don't know if you can tell me either on a yes no basis is 3.2 being going to, going to be included in the section 106 mitigations and is the upgrade to level C included in the mitigations conditional on the club achieving a promotion. Can I hand that over to Paul Martin? I, uh, sorry I obviously can't explain too much in terms of the section 106 because it's still currently live but the proposal is obviously grade D is from the 152, and that is separate and outside of the Camrose 106 proposal. The grade C is the section 106 proposal, and it's not dependent on promotion. Um, so in theory, obviously, they need to re-provide the C facility, whether or not the club is playing at step three or step four football. Okay, can I go, can I ask um, Councillor Regan? It's a question to somebody. I, I raised the issue at the last meeting in which why it was looked at, the uh, question of the council buying the, the ground and developing a, a sports complex, um, which would be a, a, not only a capital asset for the, for the community, but also uh, a good facility. And actually would solve a lot of uh, problems. And, and it seemed to be, was, was the, plan, the pending plan application stopping them from considering it properly or did they just rule it out? I've got a feeling most of that was addressed in the report, but does anybody want to, yeah, sorry, Councillor Bean, do you want to yeah. respond to that? So I, I think I, I've, I've laboured the point um, a couple of times now that we will, it would not be appropriate for us to allocate multi-millions of pounds to purchase this facility. We also need to be mindful of the fact that um, Hampshire County Council have the right to CPO part of that land to enable the much needed improvements to Brighton Hill Roundabout. And actually it is the um, developer to provide the appropriate mitigation for that site. It's not for the council using taxpayers' money to come in and purchase that facility. And again, I would just like to remind members, given the current context that we're operating in at the moment as well, I just think that that, that would be highly inappropriate. That doesn't, however, mean that we do not or have not invested in sport. We have got a brilliant track record. We have invested millions of pounds in sport and leisure. So it is not through our lack of, um, investment in sport but it is just not the appropriate thing for us to be doing purchasing the cameras uh, can i come back chair sorry council regan the technology speak me what's the uh our relevant officer or councillor being a realized that the, uh, are they aware that while they're waiting for the plan application, youths are slowly destroying and disturbing all the, the residents at the area before the link road even comes in? So, but the, uh, are, will they put uh, uh, the resources into stopping the kids destroying and disturbing the peace of my residents? No one answering. Sorry, Councillor Bean. So are, are you referring to um, anti-social behaviour that might be taking place on the site at the moment? Not, not maybe, it is. 
Okay, well, clearly we are the main landowner at that site, that, that is Basron, and, and they do have a responsibility to ensure their site is secure. Clearly any antisocial behaviour should always be reported through the right methods, be that 111 or, or 999, but um, as I've said before, we do own a part of that land at the moment. Um, you know, I, I'm happy to take away anything we can do to support that that not happening, be that extra patrols, I don't know, it's a valid point, but I, I do want to add that it is the responsibility of the landowner as well, but I'm happy to take that away. Well, just to come back on that, Chair, I mean, Basteron are not living up to anything at the moment, always they obviously after a quick buck when they get plan permission, but the, uh, they are not protecting the, uh, the, the site. Now, I say it's overall the council. Can't I be on Basel? They have to take responsibility for the peace and quiet of my residents. And actually, it has been reported several times and, and patrols have been stepped up, but it's still continuing. So we can't rely on Basel to protect the, 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 the interests of my uh, residents. And I, that's nothing to do with the plan application. Uh, can, can, I, can I just say one of our discussion topics in the last minutes uh, in the last meeting was uh, community support officers. Uh, mine has got in touch with me. I don't suppose you've engaged with yours at all over that, Councillor Regan? Uh, yes, definitely. And they know about it and they've increased patrols. I'm just saying that I'm pointing out that bad one are not living up to their responsibilities. Appreciate that. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Cousins and Councillor McCormick uh, left, so I'll just go, go through those. So, Councillor Cousins. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the portfolio holder and officers for this report. Um, whichever way you cut it, we're going to be down one stadium. We're going to be reducing from two to one. So, drawing on the points in Section 5 and Section 6 where the last time it was properly looked was 2016, either moving the club to a new location or um, investigating the list that um, the football club had put forward as alternatives. I just want to understand why at present that has still been discounted and not considered for further thoughts and considerations. I'm happy to take that and obviously officers can add any further detail if required. I think this comes back to the point that we are in the middle of a live planning application and as part of that process there are Sport England as a statutory consultee to determine what appropriate mitigation is. It would be wrong at this time for us to predetermine the outcome of that application and part of that, to my mind, would be starting to look at additional sites. We need to wait for the planning process to run its course, which it has not yet concluded. But as I have said already, what we are doing and will continue to do is work with the club and have an open dialogue around how we support them in the future. And that, that you know, post the outcome of what the planning application process will be, how we continue to support them as we do with other clubs in the borough. Chairman, I might be able to um, assist Councillor Bean with um, part of the answer. So I'm Ruth Ormella. I'm the Head of Planning, Sustainability and Infrastructure, and I happen to be on the call for a later item. Would you like me to um, speak to some of these points that have been raised? Sorry, yes, please. Yes, it's just a funny coincidence I happen to be on the call and I just want to remind members that we actually have a published uh, agenda for this particular planning application. It is live and it's able to be viewed um, publicly so members of the public can actually read the full officer assessment report. Um, I am going to refer to that because it's a full assessment which is in the public domain that can be read and on pages 28 all the way through to page 32 the assessment in relation to the loss of the community facility, the replacement mitigation measures and the section 106 details are all um, assessed and presented in full in an appropriate planning report, which is somewhat different to what you um, have on your agenda. And um, as Councillor Bean has highlighted, it's actually the current application that we have before us, which is all we are able to assess. We can't when assessing a planning application, come up with 
alternative strategies or locations or alternative proposals that are different to that which the applicant has put before us. So in um, considering the planning application, as Councillor Bean has highlighted, we went to the statutory consultees, we have their assessment and we've included that in the report and that's proposed to be captured by way of the section 106 obligation. And just for a complete clarity, the actual obligation is to lift the standard from um, the category C to the category D. So it is the gap between C to D, which is what the mitigation um, would entail. But members can go to page 31 of that report. It's in the public domain. It's all detailed there. But um, you know, as um, Councillor Bean has indicated, really difficult. Um, for, off, for members tonight to be able to be making comments, especially if they're on planning committee, that imply any predisposition or predetermination on the matter. Uh, thank you for that. And, and, I, and I think uh, I'm going to use that to close down this, this, um, this um, item on the agenda, to be honest. I think there's too many questions which are related to planning. We don't have the answers for them and we can't. Chair, I had a question that was not related to planning. Uh, okay, last question. Okay, so um, in view of the fact that um, the Hampshire Regulatory Committee have passed a planning application for the relief road, um, I, I think we're some way down that road of losing the cameras anyway. And I'll try and be as objective as possible. They do have contingencies if they didn't get the road, but you know, I, I don't think it's for us to second guess them. Um, taking in the context that this council has also given £10 million to build a hotel on Basing View, and we've heard from the portfolio holder tonight that it'd be inappropriate for us to, to buy the Camrose ground, uh, but we also have a council motion, which on page 17 of the papers tonight states we'll do our utmost um, in, in this situation to, to help the club find a new home. To what extent is the portfolio holder prepared to help the club and, if necessary, um, assist in the identification and purchase of a suitable Grade C venue? Could be anywhere. Doesn't necessarily be the Camrose, could be anywhere. So I think that we have demonstrated already our commitment to getting the club back to Basingstoke with the improvements that are being made to Winklebury at the moment to take that to grade D. In terms of the future, as I've stated, there is still a live planning application that deals with the mitigation required for the loss of cameras. And as I've also stated, the dialogue with the club will continue in terms of what future provision looks like and what needs might be through the appropriate process or route, which is the LRNA. Um, and, and who knows what, what that need or provision might look like in the future. It, it's too early to say at this point. So we have worked tirelessly to get to where we are today. And we have almost achieved that objective of getting the club back to the town. We've got a live planning application, which will be determined next week. And then, as I said, there's that future conversation around how we support the club in, in achieving their ambitions for the future. Chair, with all due respect, the portfolio holder hasn't answered the question. The question is very specific. To what extent is the portfolio holder go going to help the club including assisting fi finding and buying a suitable location. I'm not constraining us to the cameras. Uh, saying that there's a live planning application is irrelevant to that question. And saying that we're part way through a process is irrelevant to that question. I want to know if the portfolio holder is going to honor the, the wording of the motion or not, because other comments suggest otherwise. So we will, we, we, we will not be allocating multi-millions of pounds to purchase a football facility now or, or in the, the short to medium term future. And I think we've made that position quite clear before that we are not a council with an ambition to, to run a football club or stadium. Um, and I think we've been quite clear on that mm. front. In which case you're breaking the promise in the motion. I, I don't think the promise was a financial promise. 
if I remember rightly. The words are very specific. Do our utmost. We're not doing our utmost. We've said we're not going to do something. Anyway, I, I'd like to um, to thank everybody for the, the contribution tonight. I, I do think we've got lots of holes in this, which can only be answered once the uh, planning uh, process. Oh, excuse me, Chair. We've been trying to speak for ages. Put our hands up. You're not using the system that works. You know, when you put your hands up electronically, and then we're excluded from speaking. Uh, sorry, uh, Professor Tilby, I, I don't have your hand up on the electronic system. Oh, wait, I your... No, I didn't. You told us not to use it. And I've been waving my hands around like this for, you know, some time and obviously been completely ignored. OK. I mean, no, I mean, normally I appreciate the vice chair normally does that function, you know, in the meeting, but because of these Zoom means it is more difficult, which is why they have an electronic function, which this council refuses to use. Those of us who use this in our daily lives don't have any problem with this technology, but, you know, we, we insist on having us waving our arms around like a load of crazy people. Councillor Tilbury, do you have a, a non-planning related question? Yes, I do. Well, the, the, I wanted to make the point that it, we're talking about like-for-like -like replacements you know, for a band C and they're at band D, but they were at band B, oh, sorry, they were at level grade B originally back as far as 2016. They were, the Camrose was a, a band or grade B facility. That's what they were then. When we were working with them to build a new club on the common before we were chased off by the dog walkers, they were looking at a stadium with a capacity of seven and a half thousand, a massive new stadium. And we were going to, you know, we were going to help fund that because we were going to make money from selling our third of the side because everyone keeps forgetting we own a third of this land and we've now lost all the value in that because they're going to turn it into a road, which we're going to give away free to access Mr. Rosak's development. This is an absolute scandal. And to say that we've got to wait for the planning application well, that's, and, you know, and the people who can go along and speak to that, well, they will do. They get a whole, all of four minutes, won't they, next week to make their concerns heard on this. This is a problem this council has created. We've lost any money that we could have gained from the development there. We've allowed the, the, develop, the, the landowner to take over the club, run the club into the ground. The whole thing is absolutely scandalous and we're saying we can't do anything we've got no responsibility we can, the only reason the land's worth multi millions of pounds as councillor bean keeps saying is because we've allowed him to do this it's just shocking you know and i don't think you know any plan and navigation is going to make a great deal of difference so what we do with this we cannot unless we can provide them with a facility we created this mess we facilitated the attempts to move them off the site there Initially, probably it was meant as a victimless crime that everyone would gain, but it's not turned out that way. We've ended up penniless. We've lost all our land value, which we know turned into a pointless road. And at the same time, the club's lost their home, and the best they can hope for is they may get a grade C facility in the long run, which, as Councillor McCormack and others have pointed out, is for and even the club themselves. It's probably not going to be achievable on the Winkle Recycle because it isn't physically big enough. This is absolutely crazy. It's a disgrace. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I understand your frustration. I'm not really sure if there was a question there. Um, so I, I can't really open it to, to, uh, to officers. I, I don't suppose any officers want to respond to that. Unfortunately, we do have a process for it, and it is the planning process. But um, yeah. I'd just like to say, Chair, I agree with Philbury. They're, the road is to nowhere and it's, it will cause havoc. The link road. I, I will say it because it's my patch. And we are opposing it as wall councillors and will be next week. Okay, thank you. C Councillor Kinnear, well, a last question on this. Gosh, apologies, Chair. I didn't have my hand up. Apologies. Okay. All right, so, um, well, can, can I thank Steve Williams for coming. Um, I, I appreciate frustration. Um, we, we've got another process which we need to, to uh, have results from. Um, all I can suggest is we bring it back when we're informed of the results of that process and we discuss it in another CEP meeting. Uh, is everybody happy with that, um, that way forward? 
I only see, could you put, could you put your hands up if you're happy with that? Okay, there's, there's, there's probably 50%. All right, right, okay. So um, the committee is asked to note the responses to the questions asked as set out in the report. Uh, and I'll move on to uh, item eight, update on the ice rink. So uh, a contact officer is Kate Dean. Um, can I ask Kate Dean to introduce this item, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Good evening, committee members. Uh, this is another update uh, on the ice rink at the Leisure Park. Um, we were asked by members at the last CEP to make some further inquiries of the local authorities at Milton Keynes and uh, Cardiff about their ICE facilities, uh, which we have done. Uh, I'll hand over to a colleague, Jonathan Bannon, to give you an update on that point shortly. Um, and then further update in terms of the current ICE rink um, is that we have been continuing to liaise with the operator Planet ICE about uh, works that are required to the rink. Um, we had hoped that we would have a specification for the required works uh, to the rink as we stand this evening that is still awaited. Uh, so Jonathan, could you please provide the update on Cardiff and Milton Keynes? Yeah, thanks Kate. So as uh, requested at the last CAP meeting, we've been in contact with uh, various parties involved with the Cardiff ice rink and the Mil uh, ice rink at Milton Keynes. Uh, the ice, temporary ice rink in Cardiff was actually always planned to have a six year life cycle um, due, whilst they uh, redeveloped the uh, town centre ice rink um, for a town centre extension. Um, it was eventually used for 10 years as reported in the uh, report um, and came in at a cost of around 2.7 million pounds. So um, quite an expensive uh, temporary ice rink. Milton Keynes, on the other hand, um, they needed a temporary ice rink for approximately 12 months whilst the ice rink was refurbished. Um, that uh, temporary ice rink was housed in a building which was uh, gifted to the um, ice users group who ran the uh, temporary ice rink for the period of time that it was operating. Um, they managed to uh, secure the um, ice pad, the barriers, some plant lighting seats and skate hire on a leased basis um, for the period of 12 months. Hence, it came in at a more reasonable £170,000 cost. Um, the reason they managed to bring it in at at that level of cost as well, run by the ICE users group, and it was uh, it was basically uh, volunteers that, that ran the uh, the facility. Um, yes, that's that that's it as far as the temporary ice rink. Sorry, Kate. Okay. Sorry, Kate. Did you want to add to that? No, that's it, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we, we also have um, two guest speakers here. Um, we've got Sally Cashman and Heath Rhodes. So can I invite Sally Cashman to uh, to uh, speak? Uh, uh, Sally Cashman's not online at the moment, but um, Martin uh, Heath Rhodes is. Uh, can I ask Heath Rhodes to uh, speak, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks, Heath. Uh, you have two minutes. Uh, we'll remind you um, 30 seconds before the two minutes ends. Yeah, sure. Um, the um, Planet Ice has recently um, invoked two reports, uh, both on behalf of ourselves and also on behalf of Basingstoke Council. Those two reports give an insight into what the current issues are with the existing rink with regards to resolving those problems to allow continued activity into the future. <clears throat> we met with, uh, we've had discussions with both Kate Dean and Jonathan Bannon uh, with regards to those reports. 
and it was also agreed that if they wanted to uh, speak with another third party and get a separate review, then obviously, you know, we would welcome that. We have asked on uh, several occasions if we could have an insight into that report or reports. Uh, it's never been refused. Um, it's also been agreed that it would help assist us in creating a scope of works and costings to resolve the issues that exist in the rink as it is at the moment, which predominantly is about the what we call the ice heave or permafrost that exists in the building that's creating the problems that are there. Um, <clears throat> we have been informed on several occasions that that report from that they've requested from a third party is currently has currently not been received. We know that it has been received. Meaning. So that's your, that's your tw thirty second warning. Oh, sorry. Uh, and what I'd like to ask is, uh, we've been refused the report to have access to it. I think that the, from what we know of the report, it has inaccuracies referring to planet ice in there. And I would like to know that when a report is distributed of this kind, is there an issue with an operator like ourselves having access to that report, particularly to review the items that would be inaccurate? Yeah and would affect people's judgment when making a decision on the future of the works. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, just, just to answer that, uh, nobody on CEP has seen the reports either, so I'm not sure if this is the right uh, forum to discuss that, but is there anybody from, uh, from our officers who can respond to, to that, that request to see the reports? Uh, yes, certainly, Chair. I'm happy to pick that point up. I think, as we said in our paper, um, there have been uh, three reports that have been commissioned recently. Some time ago, um, although not required to do so, the Council, uh, in an attempt to, to resolve the issues, um, volunteered to fund a suite of surveys um, with the work to be undertaken by Origin Partners. Uh, there was to be one to the roof and frame, one to the M&E, and the other one to look at the ice pad itself. Uh, because of the existing ownership structure with the asset being owned by Standard Securities and the lessee, the operator, Planet Ice, uh, effectively it's, it, their, it's their asset. We had to secure their uh, consent to do them. At the time, we could only get consent from Planet Ice to do the survey to the roof and frame. Uh, that has been concluded. Um, Planet Ice helpfully uh, volunteered to then commission and undertake uh, the two further reports themselves with consultants of their choice. Those reports have been completed. Um, I think it, it, they were not, just to be clear, they were not undertaken on behalf of the council. They were undertaken by the operator. Um, they have got an obligation in conjunction with the owner to keep this asset in repair. So uh, they were, as I say, undertaken by the operator for their benefit, but they have been uh, shared with officers. Um, the, Council has also commissioned a fourth report, which is currently in draft, and it has been commissioned from uh, uh, technical specialists. The council does not have in-house any ice rink specialists, uh, and these parties have been appointed to help the council um, achieve a sort of objective view on what's happening at the rink. Uh, the intention had been that the technical expert would uh, uh, do the surveys, but that on the basis that Planet Ice have stepped in and done those reports themselves, uh, the intention is that the technical expert will review the Planet Ice report. Uh, that report is still in draft uh, and therefore it's not appropriate that it is discussed further at this point. Is that a such satisfactory answer, uh, Mr Rhodes? Well, we're aware of the answer. Um, we're aware of the report. And the report 
contains inaccuracies about yeah, we, 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 we can't discuss it in this this meeting because we were not aware of the reports not none of the councillors or members uh, have, have seen any of those reports so it, this isn't the right forum to, to discuss that uh, can I take it another stage and can I ask as, as part of this committee that um, officers communicate with all stakeholders and, and try and resolve this? There's obviously there's issues from both sides here and we need to, go, we need, we need to move forward with, with it really. Paul, can I just say then that the report that we've been made aware of uh, we, I was told by Jonathan Bannon was not a very, was was not su substantial when I asked him last time. But is this the draft report you referred to? It strikes me it is not a draft report. Uh, I don't know what we're defining as draft, but it strikes me it is very detailed. It is eleven pages in length, and is made up of one re referral by IPW, uh, which we respect and are very experienced in their field. And is, is, is this the draft report? Sorry? Is this a, sorry, Kate, is this the draft report that you referred to? Yes, that's correct, Chair. So it has not been reviewed by legal or finance, and therefore at the moment uh, it is a confidential draft, uh, and any views that it expresses are those of the authors. Okay, so sorry, Mr. Rhodes, to cut you down on this, but um, we can't discuss a, a report we've not seen, and certainly when it's only in a, its draft form, it's not for this this um, this meeting. So I apologise for that, but uh, we'll have to move on. Um, we've got another guest speaker, uh, Sally Cashman. Has she arrived yet? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Sally. You, Thanks for coming. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Um, right. Can I uh, give you two minutes? We'll tell you when it's 30 seconds left. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask if the Users Forum are considered a stakeholder in this. Um, also, if the repairs to the ice rink take six months or more, the clubs that use it will not be able to continue. Um, we will need a temporary rink for that time. Um, I'm pleased to see that from the reports that the council have approached Milton Keynes and gained valuable insights into the temporary rink they had. Bearing this in mind, what specifically can the council do to help facilitate a temporary rink? Where do you stand on providing an empty unit from, from your portfolio to house a temporary rink? Alternatively, would the council be willing to share the cost of the repairs to the rink? Um, I just also wanted to say that the Ice Users Forum is extremely keen to work with all the interested parties to ensure that we do keep an ice rink in Basingstoke. Is that you finished? That's me finished. Thanks, Sally. Appreciate that. Um, does anybody want to answer that? Uh, yes, Chair, uh, I'll pick up some of those points. Um, firstly, in terms of um, the need for temporary ice rink, uh, we can't comment on that until we know what the repair strategy is for the rink itself. Uh, and to do that, we need to see a costed specification from Planet Ice and Standard Securities, uh, that's still awaited. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, Sally's request about um, availability of an alternative property, uh, we can take that away once the information as to whether or not a temporary facility is actually need, needed and for how long uh, to see whether there is anything in the portfolio. Um, and in terms of making a contribution to the cost, uh, I, I, I really can't comment on that. Nobody has made a request to the council to do that. Um, so I can't comment on that. Okay, uh, can I just add, uh, Sally, uh, both, both yourself and uh, 
Heath, we, I do value as stakeholders. I, I do see that you're a very important contribution to this, this committee. Um, and um, and yeah, and I, I encourage you to continue turning up for, for the committee and putting your, your say forward. Um, we've got in the report, a, a, I mean, there's a lot of what a lot of reports which are which are flying around at the moment, and, and the committee has, hasn't seen any of them apart from the initial uh, structural survey report, which um, pushed us into a position where we we look for temporary sites. We probably need to see those before we can continue with this conversation. In the report, um, that there is a request or there is a requirement or statement saying that there's going to be a specification made by Planet Ice, and that's due for um, passing on to Basingstoke and Dean for comment this month. So I hope that can continue. It's looking like, or I think there's another statement that says there's a, a Christmas, um, a potential Christmas issue to. to Future potential vendors. Um, so we're looking at um, probably January, February before we get prices back. And if it's a six months construction project, September at the earliest to get the ice rink finished. I don't know if anybody wants to comment or any officers want to comment on that to see if it's realistic. Uh, Chair, we continue to liaise with Planet Ice. Uh, it is in their gift in terms of when they make the specification available for us to review. Okay. Well, I'm going to open it up to uh, councillors for questions. Uh, I've got Councillor Taylor first. Sorry, Councillor Taylor, you're on mute. Oh, right. OK, thank you. Um, I've just uh, got a couple of uh, points and possibly um, uh, something to ask uh, Councillor Isaac as well, if I if I if I may. Um, one observation coming from this and, and listening to, to speakers is we seem to have sort of two reports in various stages on both sides. Uh, neither party seems to be willing to sort of exchange information and it feels a bit like a game of whack-a-mole and we don't entirely know which mole needs whacking. Um, and I think we really need to sort of find some way forward with that. Um, certainly, I don't see why councillors couldn't see uh, reports uh, through the pink paper process, but at the very least, certainly I, I don't know how other councillors would feel about it, would, would like some from our own officers quite quick uh, confirmation about the safety issues and confirmation that users are not in any way at risk. Um, you know, we've been aware that there have been safety problems and what we don't want to find ourselves is in a uh, terrible situation where the roof collapses on people or if there's any imminent danger about that and as a council we ignored ignored that so I think I would you know for based on what you've seen so far I would really like to ask officers to issue us with some form of assurance about safety and the safety for users at, at, at this stage if that's okay um, and I do think that you know this is a start to feel a bit like banging heads together really in terms of people not not sharing information and, and it's going to be the people of Basingstoke who are going to be the losers um, and I do feel, I'm sure, as, as others will be, starting to lose a bit of patience over this. And, and in that context, I noticed that um, there was discussions with, with Cardiff. Obviously, Cardiff eventually had a different operator. Um, so I don't know if there was any information in respect of that that might be, be useful for consideration of updating uh, to, to members. But also, perhaps what may now be getting relevant, if this is going to keep you sort of dragging on on this to and fro in sort of uh, situation we have is where are we with regard to the development of the leisure park? Um, where is uh, New River retail? Where is it in terms of having an ice rink and, and the possibility of different operators if necessary if we can't get this moved forward? Thanks very much. It's, uh, I saw you hand waving. Do you want to respond to that? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Um, uh, Councillor uh, Taylor um, raises some um, uh, Im important questions, I think. Um, so if we just uh, start by looking at the question of the reports, um, as the officers have, have uh, stated, uh, two reports have been uh, commissioned by Planet Ice, not on behalf of the council, but they've been commissioned. Technical reports on the M&E and on the ice. And we've seen those, uh, but um, as I understand it currently, Planet Ice uh, do not want the distribution of those reports to go any further. Um, I'm not sure why, but and perhaps they can answer that. Um, on the report, the specialist report that we felt we needed because this is a specialist field, um, ice rinks and so forth. Um, yeah, that, that report is, is, is still um, in draft. Um, it hasn't been signed off by me. It hasn't gone to the senior leadership team. It hasn't gone to the finance department. It hasn't gone to the legal department. It hasn't gone to senior management board. Uh, so the fact that it's for that that that, that um, it's been provided at this stage to uh, Planet Ice is something that causes me great concern, actually. And um, somebody had there's been a breach of, of uh, duty there, and we are looking into that. Um, but. Um, you know, I don't want to um, convey the impression that we're not trying genuinely to work with uh, Planet Ice to find a solution here. And um, the, re the reports I've been having from officers, uh, we're on the lines that, yeah, we're in a dialogue and we're waiting for, now these reports have been done uh, on behalf of Planet Ice, we're waiting for a specification and a costing, and, and then we can sort of go to the next stage. Uh, so I hope that, um, that, that, that that process will continue. Um, on the point about the uh, New River and the, and the Leisure Park, um, councillors will know that um, there was that long hiatus because of the legal challenges on procurement. Um, they took they set us back 18 months that's been resolved um then of course uh covid arrived on <coughs> the doorstep and uh, that's affected new rivers business and has uh obviously impacted on on leisure generally and and uh, clearly um we don't yet know the full um long term uh, if they are long term implications for the leisure industry of, um, of, the, of the pandemic. But um, it, I, can, I can tell councillors that uh, in uh, recent weeks, uh, there's been uh, some very uh, uh, strong uh, indications from uh, New River that they uh, uh, are now in a position to um, take, take forward the development agreement that we've entered into with them. Uh, and appoint their consultants and begin the process of uh, uh, further engagement with stakeholders and also the public uh, in, uh, as, uh, in, in, uh, on the road to um, putting forward a planning application. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to be able to report that um, positive development, which has literally um, reached our ears in the last uh, few weeks. Thanks for that, Councillor Isaac. Um, Councillor Taylor, you've still got your hand raised, uh, but I'd like to move on to Councillor McCormick. Ah, thank you, Chair. Um, am I right in thinking that basically the, the clock's ticking on the existing ice rink? Um, we were told last year it had best case two years to go with heave and various other things um we've still got at least another six months before we could even have some kind of outline plan for another site so am i right in thinking that basically we're expecting the existing sites to carry on being used on an almost indefinite basis. What plans do we have to refurbish the existing site or um, come up with a permanent alternative to it? 
I think I could probably answer that. We, we, we've sort of uh, discussed this quite, quite long. Uh, we had the initial report, which, which pushed us towards getting the uh, temporary sites. Uh, but then another uh, mention or another report came up where there was going to be a study into keeping the existing site. Uh, and that's what we're waiting for. Uh, and unfortunately, we're not in a position to, to go any further with this because we haven't got those reports issued to us. I don't know if anybody, any officers want to, to add to that. Uh, yes, Chair, I'm happy to add to that. Um, yes, we did a comprehensive review of three potential alternative sites, which was brought to the committee. Uh, they were discounted on the grounds of, of, of cost and viability or exceptionally difficult to deliver. Um, we therefore reverted to looking at refurbishing the existing facility. Uh, New River have confirmed historically that they would be happy for the ice rink to stay in its current location and refurbishing the existing facility uh, is un understood to be likely to be the most cost effective option by a considerable margin. If I may, so we're saying that we're waiting for Planet Ice to come back with some kind of, I don't know, who's who's going to refurbish this uh, existing site? Who's going to pay for it? How much is it going to cost? We're waiting for reports we haven't got. So we've dismissed one alternative. We don't have another another plan. But in the meantime, I've got no confidence that this ice rink is going to be usable in two years' time and we've got any contingency whatsoever. Well, what is the contingency at the moment? Well, I mean, it does say in the report we're waiting for a specification, and obviously that specification will get a cost from bids. Yeah, but uh, that's not a contingency, is it? Just, Basically, we've got nothing. We, we've we discounted one option, and we're waiting to see if we can do something second. So we don't have a plan. The ice ring is, you know, deteriorating rapidly. We don't have a plan. We've... We've had over a year and we've not come up with anything. Uh, Councillor Isaac. Yeah. Um, I think you need to get back to the position that the council's not running an ice rink, Councillor McCormack. Um, we have understood from uh, Planet Ice that they feel confident that the ice rink, uh, the ice uh, surface will uh, continue to be serviceable. I take the point you make though that, 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 that clearly it's not in good shape so that that could change but um, I think that uh, there's there's an understanding um, between us and Planet Ice and Sound Securities that uh, repair of the um, uh, current ice rink is the best option and we uh, are pressing them we are um, chasing them to provide us with the reports and the specifications and the costings, and that has yet to be forthcoming. Can I just pick up on one thing that I omitted to deal with uh, from Councillor Taylor, Chairman? Yeah, sure. And that's on the issue of safety, which we take very seriously, um, particularly given uh, uh, what's happening in, in, uh, to, to, to our world as a result of uh, the pandemic. And officers, uh, there are safety issues, there are safety concerns, and, and uh, they are, uh, and officers uh, do regularly um, look at the building to check on health, health and safety. And uh, if, uh, I, I, I think that if, if there is a request for an update on that, um, then uh, uh, that's something that can be provided. Do you know if any of the reports which we've asked for uh, cover that ground? Uh, there, are, Chair, there are questions. Go on, Kate, you do it. I was, Chair, I was just going to say that the, the Ridge report that we had on the frame and the roof uh, did identify that there were some potential issues uh, relating to the heave causing um, tension on some of the handrails. I had reassurance from uh, Planet Ice uh, earlier in the week that that was being addressed this week. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask before we do, I, I get more questions in, have we got any of the speakers uh, still online? No. 
Um, I, I was just commenting on the timeframes here. Um, it, do, it does say on the on the Bison's website that uh, the season's been postponed, and I just wanted to have an idea um, how that affects um, the ice users. That, that, that's all. Um, maybe we can I can request that from the ice users for next meeting. Chair, both both of them are still here. Did you want me to bring in? Um, yeah, if we can invite yeah, Sally Sally first, yeah. Hi, Sally. Um, hi. So, sorry, Sally, I just, I just wanted to ask, um, with the uh, sort of postponement of the season of, for, for the Bisons, uh, I just wanted to know where, where that puts you. Um, as chairman of the Ice Users Forum, the um, Bison are one part of it. The other users have been back and are using the rink. And by all accounts, um, from what I've seen from social media, Planet Ice are doing a really good job with the COVID precautions and keeping things very safe. Um, from a Bison point of view, as a Bison fan, not speaking as chair, I they have put off the season until at least January. I think just speaking personally with no expertise other than knowing the COVID rate is going up again and knowing it, it likes cold places. I think the, and given that the elite league, which is the league above us has canceled their season this season, the 2021 season, I think it's possible we might not have one. I hope there is, I really do hope there is, but there's a lot of ifs and buts to get there. But the other ice users, speaking as chair again, the other ice users are using the ice rink. The junior training has started again, the synchro teams are back, and I gather the um, individual figure skaters are back training. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Heath would be able to tell you if the um, general public have been skating. To be honest with you, it's not something I, I have actually never set foot on the ice, to be honest with you. Um, so I don't skate, so I wouldn't know. But I, I gather the ice drink is operating as normally as possible. So, Right. Uh, Heath, uh, thanks for that, Sally. Um, Heath, are you, are you online? Hello. Hi, Heath. Uh, Hi. I just wanted to ask you the same question, really. I mean, uh, we've had a number of questions about um, uh, what state the ice is in. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, could, could, could you reply to that? And, and, um, and secondly, what, what are Planet Ice's uh, plans for keeping the rink open over the next period? Uh, well, we've had a visit from the Environmental Health Officer uh, about three weeks ago, uh, which I spoke to him myself. Um, there were some concerns over air circulation uh, which we uh, gave him uh, lots and lots of technical input from providers that have been helping the DCMS uh, as well as our own industry to resolve, which as far as I'm aware, um, he was satisfied with. We've had no response to that. And if, if that needs to be forwarded to anybody else, uh, it's in email format and, uh, and we're happy to make that available. Um, he was in, very satisfied with the processes that we put in place with regards to safety under the current COVID-19 guidelines set out by the government. Um, so that's point one. Um, with regards to the life cycle of the rink, uh, from our perspective, we have never indicated that the rink has a life cycle of two years. Now, this was covered in a lot of detail in an open forum meeting that we had about two years ago in the October that Mike Bovis attended. And I think Sally would have been there along with a number of other people within the community where it was made clear that it was very uncertain as to uh, how long the rink would last purely because of what was going on with the permafrost. Uh, so I'd just like to clear that issue up. With regards to where the ice pad is today, 
there is no initial concerns over the failing of the pad. It's just that if we get to a point where the header does break off, then the, we will lose the ice. In the sense of safety on the ice pad, there are no concerns. The concern is, from a technical point of view, is if the header breaks off, which is undetermined, then at that point, the ice will be lost and it will be melted and we will not be in a position, unless if we go into expense, to recover that in the immediate future. Saying that, we have spoke with Jonathan and Kate with regards to a number of issues. And one of them was that we were prepared to enter in to a conversation over the joint costs of repairing the rink and its surrounding area. And we put a figure on that at the time of 1.25 million, which I think certainly Jonathan will recall. And we advised them against a temporary rink and we also advise that given the work that would be required to put the actual pad itself and the dashes and the, the initial concerns sorted would be a six to eight month process. And we have experience in this area. We've done it recently in Blackburn. And we are also uh, developers of our own rinks, of which we've got one uh, recently developed in Leeds and we've also developed in Bristol. Oh, okay, thanks for that. So, so I can sort of, we can sort of assess that um, there's no CV19 safety issues. That's all been uh, made satisfactory. In your opinion, general safety of the rink is satisfactory. Uh, you mentioned this header, and, uh, and I don't I don't understand what that is. Um, I, I don't know if any other committee members in. I don't, I don't. Could you could you supply a bit more detail on what that is? That seems to be in your mind the uh, the main issue. The the header trench is at one end of the ring, and the header trench is what supplies the um, the solution that freezes the water on the pad. So if you imagine uh, an art, listen, I'm not technical and neither am I an ice skater. So uh, you know, just bear with me. But if the, the filament that runs through the pad is very similar to a kettle and those pipes are fed from the header trench. Now, because of the permafrost scenario underneath and the permafrost scenario in this is one of the areas that we take issue with because originally there was a heater mat that existed uh, below the pad would have stopped permafrost from taking place. And it's been indicated several times that Planet Ice were responsible for that heater mat no longer functioning. And uh, we dispute that. And the causes that we find in the heave today on this pad have resulted uh, to some extent from that heater mat no longer working. And there are some people over on the ice users forums that have some detail on that matter and why it no longer functions. So the, the actual header trench itself is what houses uh, and connects the pipes that form the solution around the ring that allows the ice to, uh, allows the water to freeze. The moment that we have any movement underneath the pad as a result of permafrost is the moment that that header, tren header trench can technically snap off the pipes. And at that point, there would be nothing that we could do to salvage the ice. Now that, 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 that occurrence is undetermined. That does not affect the safety of a skater that affects the time span with which the ring, the pad is in existence. And that is determined by the movement underneath the pad as a result of permafrost. Uh, and can I, can I ask these, these reports, which we've not yet seen, do they address that, that issue? Uh, and will your specification that you've, uh, which is noted that you're writing, will, will that address the, the, um, the fixing, the repair costs of that? 
Yes, my understanding is from the meeting that I had with Kate on Monday is that if we submit to them our proposal for standard securities, planet ice and the council to take um, a shared um, a share in the expense of that, then it would be considered um, is point one. Yeah, um, can I just clarify that conversation that I had on Monday? Um, which was with Heath and Mike Petruas, that uh, Mr. Petruas indicated that uh, he thought that the uh, cost of the repair was in the region of one to 1.25 million pounds. Um, and that uh, he wanted to make a request uh, to the council to share that. I made no comment about that other than to say, if that's what he wanted to do, uh, we would take his request uh, and I would raise that with members as a point of discussion. And also in terms of the point about the heater pad, if that he felt that that was a basis of making a request that he should put that in his request, uh, but that would be a point that the council would dispute. Okay, uh, so, sorry, um, let's just go back. Um, we, we mentioned before the general safety was satisfactory for mm -hmm. ICE users. In your opinion, have we got say 12 months left on the ICE? Is That's a question to Heath. The look, you know, this this is a question. Uh, uh, this is this is not a political answer. And uh, and in, in fairness and in view of transparency, we have to go back to what we have been maintaining for some time. And I appreciate that in some cases, this may go before Kate and Jonathan were involved in the project, but we've always maintained that it is very much undetermined, the, the, the life cycle of the rink pad. The structure as it stands at the moment from the reports that have been submitted is sound. The concrete slab that the pad exists on is where we are seeing the movement and the heave. And it is undetermined. And sometimes it can be based on weather. My understanding is that there is, um, some kind of, kind of underground water movement uh, that exists below where our site is. And that runs down to what was potentially some kind of river or waterway at the bottom. Now, on the basis that, uh, and you'll see this yourself in the park, when you, when you look at the car parking situation, it's based on a chalk base. So you will see movement that could be greater depending on rainfall, dependent of movement of the earth underneath. So to put a time span on how long the, the rink pad may exist is um, I would not be in a position to say that and I would be unfair to put any kind of life, life, life cycle on it of a year, six months, three months, uh, I think in the previous meetings that I've been involved in where there was an open forum, it was stated there and supported by Mike Bovis at the time that it could happen tomorrow. It yeah, I, I, I appreciate it's a difficult question. Uh, I just, it just, I'm trying to get as much information as I can before we, we sort of move on to general questions. Uh, uh, Paul, what we are doing is we are reviewing it on a regular basis. We are looking at the movement and, uh, and, and right now, and certainly over a period of the time that I have been involved in this project, which is probably now about two and a half years, the movement has been very small. Okay. Uh, Councillor Isaac, you've got your hand wave, waving at me. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, think, I think this um, open uh, discussion is, is, has been helpful. But um, I have to say that, uh, you know, as a council, a public body, um, we, we need um, professionally provided specifications and costings. 
um, we cannot sort of proceed on the basis of ballpark figures uh, from however expert a source it might be. There is nothing in our capital budgets at, um, at present for the council to um, step in and uh, uh, assist Planet Ice and, and Standard Securities with their repairing obligations. But as, uh, as Kate Dean has said, uh, we will look at anything that comes through, but it has to be on a proper professional basis. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree, um, Councillor Isaac. And I know uh, what I'm trying to do is, is unconventional, but I'm just trying to get some information so we can move forward a little bit. Um, it, it is frustrating. There's a number of reports there, and there seems to be some communication error or issues, uh, which, you know, as part of this meeting, I want to try and resolve, but uh, if not in this, this meeting later on. And um, really, I'm just trying to establish uh, what life cycle we've got on the, on the ice and to see if that's changed in any, but it just sounds like we need to get the reports in order and for Planet Ice to, to do the specification so that council officers can comment on it and it can get out to somebody who will give us reasonable prices. Um, so uh, has any officers got anything to, uh, to, to add to that before I open it up to uh, uh, councillors? Yes, Chair, uh, just one point really. Uh, it, it's not for the council to get that specification costed. Uh, as Councillor Isaac said, this is all about Planet Ice uh, complying with their repairing liability. So it will be for them to uh, produce the specification and get the tender returns. Um, yeah, sorry, I appreciate that. I'm sorry if I, if I said anything different, but um, th there is a statement to say that uh, the council officers want to review it before it goes out to bid. Uh, we all, all we would want to do is for our technology technical experts to confirm that that specification is appropriate to remedy the ice okay. uh, would result in compliance with the repairing responsibility okay right um can i open it up to um to councillors uh, first of all i'm sorry for this jack cousins you've had your hand waved, waving at me for for a while now so um, that's jack. fine it's not a problem thank you chair um I suppose initially my first question is to Councillor Isaac. Are you taking personal responsibility for getting this issue resolved? Uh, Councillor Cousins, yes. Um, I'm the portfolio holder responsible for the leisure park uh, as the cabinet member for uh, property and regeneration. And yes, I, um, of course I am. And um, I recognise the, um, the the importance to Basingstoke of, of the ice rink. And I'm keen to see um, if we can get a, uh, a resolution to this. And I'm um, a, a tad frustrated that it's taking uh, as long as it is taking. But, you know, I think uh, tonight's meeting is, um, is, uh, is helpful. And I agree with your summation around the frustration, because it's not just yourself feeling that frustration. It is the ICE users as well who are equally as frustrated. And they could be forgiven for thinking that forever this issue is finding problems that are sticking it in the long grass or we've got to wait for this or we've got to wait for that something's being delayed something's being held back something's not being shared that's the feeling and frustration that they're getting and I just want to use this opportunity to get that across not only to you but to other members and I think we all understand their frustration I suppose the point I'm getting to is what can we do to get the right people and sorry for the corny phrase, but what can we do to get their bloody skates on and start moving this thing forward and let's get to a proper resolution that says, this is what needs to be done, this is what we can do to help, and this is the ultimate end goal. At what time scale do we think that's where we're going to be? Well, I, th I think that uh, tonight's meeting has been helpful uh, in that, um, and uh, that has been progress made. We, you know, uh, there is a good dialogue with Planet Ice and Standard Securities. I get uh, weekly um, reports from officers. It's it's always one of the top top agenda items, um, and uh, I, 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 
I, I don't see why it should take long now to get those to get the uh, the specification uh, uh, sorted and 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 come up with a with a, a proper costed um, uh, proposal. Uh, I'm aware, like everyone else listening in tonight, uh, uh, that, that, um, that, that, that there is a, there's always this ongoing risk uh, to a failure to the ice. Uh, so, but I'm not. I'm, I just want to make it clear. You know, we're not we're not sort of saying well, there's 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 a checkbook here from the council, but we are because the responsibilities do rest with Planet Ice and Standard Securities. But we are. Uh, we, we are playing up we want to play a constructive role in all this and and we we need to listen to any proposals that we get uh, provided they're on a proper professional basis thank you uh, i don't have anybody else to uh, speak um so um i'll, I'll basically sum up um obviously there's a, there's quite a number of reports which are uh, in various states of finish and we need to get those in a satisfactory state to move them forward. And uh, from that point, we need everybody to, to communicate and, and, and sort that out. It's, it's good to hear that um, Planet Ice uh, have, have met the uh, CV19 safety requirements. And it's good to hear that they feel that the, the uh, ice in its present state is safe to use and will go on or could potentially go on for, for quite a few, quite a long time. Um, we've got a deadline. I, I don't know if you want to call it a deadline for Planet Ice to produce a specification for Christmas or to be in a position for it to go out before Christmas. And, and I'd like um, to put that towards the uh, to, to Planet Ice to try and get that sorted uh, with uh, councillors um, review in place before it goes out. Um, there are a number of other issues. We've discussed a lot of them before. And I think really we need to just bring it back to, uh, to CEP at um, a next date. We do have plans to, to have a review every, month, every, every meeting for this. So can I suggest that we just bring it back to back and we, we, we comment on the, on the reports when they come back and, uh, and the finish, the finalised, then we can actually comment on them. Is everybody happy with that approach? I, I see a lot of nods. Um, yeah, okay. So um, so can I thank um, Sally and, and uh, Heath for coming? Uh, it, it's great that uh, we, we have got uh, stakeholder um, involvement. Uh, we, we need more of it and we need to get it moving onwards. Um, so it's just for, for the committee to note the update and we'll discuss it in the next meeting. Uh, so I'll move on to item nine. So item nine is the draft climate change and air quality strategy. Uh, can I ask Councillor Eaches to introduce this item? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, following uh, the, we've obviously declared a climate change emergency, so I am excited to be able to bring this new draft climate change and air quality strategy to the committee this evening. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all know is ongoing, the climate emergency hasn't gone away. In declaring our own climate emergency last year and setting extremely ambitious targets as part of this, we all acknowledge that we need to do our bit locally to tackle this global issue, but we also need to continue to lobby at a county and national scale. Since the declaration was made, the council has continued to take action and to tackle this emergency and this strategy represents a framework for action moving forward, including coordinating activity to maintain and improve air quality in the borough and capture the work we already do in this area. I will emphasize that this is a strategy and a framework. It doesn't contain all the detail and we do acknowledge that we don't have all the answers as yet and the action plan alongside this will need to continue to evolve and update. Fundamentally, as a council, we need to lead, enable and inspire. We lead by example as a community leader, especially in tackling our own emissions. We enable by facilitating change through policies and strategies, details of which may be developed elsewhere. 
but with tackling climate change and air quality all at the core of those strategies and policies. And we inspire by educating, encouraging and empowering our residents, businesses and communities to also take action. We are grateful for the input to date and developing the strategy. We've worked with a number of outside bodies and had quite a bit of input. We've done that through council groups, such as the members advisory panel, which I found really useful and officer delivery group. And it's great to know that all our officers are also ambitious and want to work alongside us in relation to this. And then increasingly through external output. So we've got a low carbon energy group, which has been going for a number of years. It's made up of a number of professionals, but we're, we're hoping to make them more independent so they can become um, a critical friend and, and continue to work with us in that respect. So we are grateful for that. And we will continue to have further external engagement, both in finalising this strategy, because the one before you tonight is a draft, and then we'll be going out for consultation, and then obviously working with everybody, residents, partners, etc., in implementing actions required. So I do welcome the input and comments of the committee moving forward. We have all made a very ambitious um, target, but I think, you know, if we can all work together and pull together, we can uh, do everything we possibly can to, to deal with this climate emergency. So if I may, I'd just like to park it over to Mark Lambert, who's going to give um, some more information, and then I'm sure the chair will open it to questions and debate. Great, thanks, Councillor Eaches. Yeah, just, just to add a little bit to what you've said there, uh, the draft strategy follows the, the Climate Emergency Declaration last summer and since then we've been really busy um, with the map um, with, and with the officer delivery group and just on the map it's really worth noting we, we, we've got on the committee this evening I think it's three or four members of the map who have been supporting us throughout. Uh, it's worth highlighting to, to councillors the diagram on, on in the paragraph 2.6 of the report which just outlines a number of meetings and opportunities that have been for officers, members and some external groups to assist us in, in, the, in the story so far. Um, we sought the, the assistance of uh, consultants WSP earlier this year um, to give us advice on how best to, to meet our ambitious targets. Um, they've written details of the emissions that we currently produce, both as an organisation and as a wider borough. Um, and with, that, with the targets from the Climate Emergency Declaration in mind, which is that we'll be net zero as, a, as an authority by 2025 in terms of our activities and as a wider borough by 2030. To put that into context, the council's activities currently amount to just under 2,400 2, tonnes of carbon per year. And in the borough, it's, it's around a million tonnes of carbon per year. So these, these aren't small amounts that we have to contend with. Um, I'm pleased to, to report that the, the advice from WSP is they feel that with the right actions and those they've identified, they feel that meeting the 2025 target is achievable, um, providing we take the actions identified. They feel that the wider target is, is a tougher one to meet. Um, and that's, to, that's picking up on the points that Council Reach has made. Some of this is outside of our control and the influence of the Borough Council is relatively limited. Um, putting that into context, um, the County Council's target for, the, for being a carbon neutral is 2050. And that's the same for the government. So this really emphasises our role in lobbying others um, and enabling those in a borough and inspiring change to make sure that we achieve our targets. Um, as Councillor Beach has said, that the, the, the strategy is really a framework for more detailed actions to be undertaken. So by way of example, policy development for the local plan update will be undertaken separately as a piece of work, uh, as a work stream um, under Councillor Raphael, and that will be reported to EPH committee as we go forward. And there are similar pieces of work that will be, be taken forward by other committees in the council and across um, other officer teams. In that respect, it's very much a cross-cutting strategy. Um, and the strategy itself is divided into six main areas. Um, these are action by all, buildings, transport, zero carbon electricity, waste consumption, and the natural environment and offsetting. And the, you'll see the strategy is divided into those, those themes and throughout, and that's, that's replicated in, the, in an action plan that accompanies the strategy. So in your report pack, you've got as Appendix 1, a copy of the draft strategy, and Appendix 2 is the action plan. We see this as being a piece of work that will evolve and develop over time, and that we'll bring it back to CEP on an annual basis to report on 
on the progress that we've made and to update on, on in detailed areas. I'm pleased to report that though, so, so far we have taken quite a few steps um, to reducing our emissions. We've mainstreamed climate change um, as an area that goes into all the reports that councillors now receive so that the councillors can be informed of that matter when they're taking decisions. It's part of our procurement processes moving forward and from next month um, we'll be using green electricity on the campus and, to, and in other buildings to support and, and complement uh, the power that comes from the solar panels. We're also proposing to, to trial some electric power tipper trucks in coming months and we're speaking to other councils about their experiences with, with an electric fleet. It's also worth mentioning that our economic recovery strategy, which went to EPH committee um, earlier this month, uh, also emphasises the role of green projects uh, in supporting climate change, uh, as well as job creation. Looking forward, we'll be working with Council Reaches to respond to the comments that we received this evening um, as we update the strategy prior to consultation. We could, the draft document will go out for, for comment uh, later in September, and that will be um, included in Basel Dergadine today, which goes out to all, to all households. Based upon the comments we receive, we'll be updating the strategy and seeking adoption in 2020, 2021. Happy to take questions this evening. I'm joined by my colleague, Sam Taylor, who's our Climate Emergency Project Manager. Thank you, Chair. Well, I think you're on chair, on um, mute, Chair. Thanks for reminding me. Um, thank you both for, for, uh, for speaking then. Um, before we come back to you, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, we, we've got a real opportunity to shape the way this document is tonight. Uh, to do it, I want to try and break it down. I've spoken to, to, to Mark about this. So we're going to go through page 51 to 63, first of all, and then we're going to go through uh, the action by all buildings, transport, zero carbon electricity, waste and consumption and natural environment and offsetting uh, as individual items. But uh, before we do that, uh, we, we have two guest speakers. Uh, so can I invite, uh, first of all, Sheila Peacock to, to, uh, to speak, please. Oh, hello, good evening, this is Sheila Peacock. I, I, Sheila, I, I'm sure you know the, the ropes, uh, you've got two minutes to speak and uh, we'll warn you 30 seconds before the two minutes. That's splendid, thank you very much. Um, and I'm welcoming this report. Um, I'm sorry that Martin Heath is not here and I would commend to you his um, response. Um, I see that, that I'm welcome that the proposals are, contain some things we really need to do stuff about. Uh, in reducing the use of private cars, decreasing energy use in buildings. I'm just concerned, Paul Beavers is another person who's apologizing tonight. Um, he made the point that uh, he thought there might be a bit of a misconception about offsetting of carbon emissions by the borough's green space, um, because the existing space doesn't actually help. What we need to do is increase the carbon capacity there. You need to increase the sequestration by both the soil improvement and growing long-lived trees or else uh, incorporating those trees into long-lived timber products um, to lock up the carbon for longer than just a few years. Um, and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization said that agriculture, particularly in the last decade, has depleted the substantive soil carbon socks. And so all the land that's used for farming, our little livestock has to be at best net zero is at present and we need to work to get the farmers to improve the soil carbon retention uh, and this isn't mentioned in any detail either the trees or the soil in either page uh, 82 or page 69 um, and nor is it nor is the challenge that we've got to improve the natural environment in the face of worsening weather conditions and particularly drought and fire 30 seconds yeah so i'm just wanted to ask does the will Will an ambitious but realizable target of reforestation, soil management, land use change to favor biodiversity be put inserted into the action plan? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, before we answer that, can I go on to our second speaker, uh, which is Martin Beerman? Martin, are you there? Hello, hello. Hi, are you hearing me now? 
Uh, we can hear you now, yes. So uh, you, uh, you've got two minutes to speak. We'll warn you 30 seconds before the two minutes. Okie dokta. I'm afraid that in my view, as it stands, this report is again just motherhood and apple pie. Each subject area refers to leading by example. That's great. But how does that fit in with offering a car as a perk to a potential new senior employee? The draft document refers to sundry action plans. Where are they or are they what is depicted as in the charts from page 74 onwards? If these are not seriously robust, the whole process is a waste of time. The transport section is very simplistic. It refers to the existing transport strategy, which was produced together with HCC. Whilst it too contains heavy emphasis on roadworks, including the dog's breakfast now in place at Thornhill Junction, the eight targets in the strategy are well presented and put forward some truly worthy projects. So what has happened now over one year on? I request that a list of progress to date be published. The borough cycle strategy is now over four years old and a review date was promised over a year ago. Meanwhile, we are allowing developers to build a new cycle path leading to a flight of stairs. Would you believe it? Somewhere there is a fractured mindset. We are still miles away from creating an environment that is safe, attractive and practical choice for cyclists in the borough so that more people are enabled to cycle safely in the area and to encourage a shift towards more sustainable transport choices and healthy lifestyles. The uh, waste and consumption section is totally toothless. Lots of potential talking with one another, no measurable targets. BDBC is still bouncing along the bottom of the recycling rates for the whole nation. What a missed opportunity for some innovative action when we were temporarily on alternative weekly collections. The natural environment and offsetting section rightly points to the importance of managing biodiversity, but it looks at the current situation through rose tinted spectacles. And there is the and you where is the reference to water pollution, light pollution and noise pollution, all of which impact on our wildlife. And as we know, this is closely linked with human welfare. Furthermore, if we were serious about air quality management, we should not be looking at the UK government, but also at the United Nations. <sighs> Thank you, Mr. Beerman. <laughs> um, Councillor Aitches and uh, Mark, can I ask you to uh, reply to those two or those queries? Yeah. Shall I start off? And I might defer to Sam as well for a couple of um, responses on the on the natural environment front, if that's okay. But if I start off on the transport aspects that, that um that Martin Beerman raised, um, referencing the transport strategy. Yes, he's right, that, that was adopted um, about 14, 15 months ago now. And um, obviously we, we're con continuing to work with Hampshire to bring forward the elements within that strategy. What we're, we're proposing to do is to come back to EPH committee on the 5th of November with an update report to, um, to tell members in a bit more detail around the work that's been undertaken since that was adopted the work in hand and the next steps in that process. So I think that's probably picking up a number of the points that Martin made. In relation to cycling and the cycle strategy, um, we are the County Council are starting work on what is called a local cycling and walking infrastructure plan that will look at the at the borough more generally um, so that we can so that we can get a, a firm understanding of issues with the, the cycling and walking network and how we can best address those those deficiencies going forwards. They've, they've done this in a number of other locations in Hampshire and they've been fairly successful in, in bringing forward deliverable schemes and attracting funding. So we're hoping that they can bring the same approach to, to Basingstoke. Um, Sam, if, are you able to pick up the points around the natural environment, if you're there, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, hi all and, and thank you, Shudo and Martin, for, for those comments. Um, I think to, to acknowledge your, your comments first, Sheila, uh, and the, the kind of increased need for the role of the natural environment, that, that's something we, we certainly see. And I think um, the action plan as an initial draft is within the the um, agenda paper here from, from page 73 that I think Martin referenced. I guess to both of your, your comments, worth acknowledging it, as Mark and, and Councillor Eaches have said from the get go, you know, this is a, an initial draft and we fully acknowledge that that this action plan is going to need uh, going to need to be updated regularly. You know, we're looking to to get something out there as a starting point, rather than continue to, to you know develop something till it becomes perfect and, and never do anything. So this was 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 getting something out there. 
as part of the action plan, we acknowledge very much the role that the natural environment will need to play, um, not just in, in mitigating climate change you know, and improving the natural environment we have in the borough to do that, but the role of, of uh, the natural environment and adaptation as well. So increasing resilience to, to the effects that we are already seeing as a result of climate change, but obviously we are expecting to, to increase. Um, that is there within the action plan to, to develop further detail there, and we're already working um, closely with our natural environment team, uh, also acknowledging the um, impact of the of the environment bill and the potential standards that are going to be in place as a result or targets set as a result of that. So, um, if uh, hoping hoping you, if, you, if you hadn't seen the action plan, it, it is in there. Um, it will need to be continued developed, and and we expect to um, to provide further detail as and when we can there. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to open up to um, to uh, councillors just if they've got any comments on this. But please note that uh, we're going to go through the document. So if if um, if you want to wait until then, then uh, so I don't have any comments or any hands up. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> councillor cousins. Thank you, chair, and um, thank you to the portfolio holder and officers for their report. I think I, I just want to talk broadly because I know we're going to go into each individual element. I think the elements that we've picked out are the right elements and ones that we should be looking at. I, my concern and my disappointment for probably want of a better word is that there are no set targets along this journey that say we want to meet such and such by such a date we know the ultimate goal at 2030 but there are no targets and stepping stones along the way of which we want to hit and I think that's a missed opportunity um, the two other wider bits that I would raise is that the green document from page 85 to 89 I understand or believe that would be the sort of public facing document that would be sort of pointed we'll be pointing residents towards in all honesty i think that is one of the worst documents we would stick in front of a resident it is not user friendly it's not engaging or inspiring it's a lot of words written in quite small type text if we want to get people on board it needs to be boiled down to two pages with images and very easy to understand text in terms of, look, this is what we're going to do and this is what we want you to do to help us. We've got to try and make it that simple so we get as much people on board as early as possible and carry them along this journey with us. Um, and then finally, the only other point I would raise is that we as councillors are all too well aware of the wonderful world of devolution and the possibilities of what may or may not happen. I suppose the $64 million question is, if we get merged either as a whole of Hampshire or with a number of other local authorities, what the bloody hell happens to this? Because it sort of seems to me that this would get chucked in a bin and we then have to start again with those neighbouring authorities and what I'd actually want is some clarity to say, look, regardless of whatever happens here, we're going to stick to our guns. 2030 is 2030. And if we get merged with anybody else, we're going to drag them along with us for 2030. Thanks for that. It seems we've already moved on to sub uh, one uh, general discussion on the on the on the document. So I, I really I wanted some questions on on what was stated from our officers and um and from our public um people but um can, can we can we have a reply to uh councillor cousins um response? yeah yeah of course i'll pick that up i'm just picking up the, the the first point around um the lack of targets in there i think part of the issue is that this is the, the start of the journey it's recording i suppose and we haven't necessarily done all the detailed work on all the aspects so whilst we might be able to attribute some targets in some areas I think it's still reliant on on kind of more specific studies on particular projects being undertaken before we can put down too much in that respect. But it's something we can take away and have a look at, I think, to see if there's any anything we can pull out from our work to date. Just in terms of the comment around the start of the document and the text heavy layout, I'm sure we can have a look at that to see if there's an executive summary of some sort that we can pull together that 
that pull, that, that summarises it in a, in a more effective and user-friendly format. So that's that's something we can take away, I think. Um, and then the final point around possible devolution, I think literally all the authorities in Hampshire have declared a climate emergency. They may be working on different timescales. So um, I think that's something, again, that we would be looked at down the line. I think all the authorities are working to similar kind of ambitious goals and, and objectives if even if the target the target dates are slightly different so I'm sure that this wouldn't be lost in the mix in that sense. Yeah just to very quickly add to that 2030 is certainly the most common date um, both locally and nationally that's that's not to say it's uniform so so there would need to be obviously a discussion but but that's certainly a, um, a common date. Thank you. So I, I will go on to item one now, which is between pages 51 and 63. So I'm not going to read this. Um, do, do we have any, any uh, councillors who have any comments on pages one to 50, uh, 63, 51 to 63? Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Chair. I mean, in, in in general terms, I think it's a it's a, a good document. I mean, it's obviously a work in progress. Um, I was just looking at section two and subsequent references to charging points, which is a a bit of a pet subject of mine, given that I've got a plug-in car now. Um, while it's it focuses on the town centre. Um, and obviously at some point we'll have to roll out residential charging. Um, would it be possible to also include the district centres um, in, in a similar capacity to the town centre? Um, we are in the process of having Chinham um, regenerated, revamped, transformed, whatever, and we'll get charging points as part of that. So that's a, a quick win. But I'm also thinking of Brighton Hill, Tadley, Overton and Whitchurch. Um, in some of these cases, they're a significant distance from town. Um, in others, they're not that far from town, but they have significant volumes of traffic um, and, and therefore significant potential for, for charging points. I was just wondering if we could include that in. I'm happy to pick that up, Chair. That that's um, well. We are we are um, in the process of looking at opportunities around the borough for introducing additional EV charging points. Um, I think the issue with some of the district centres, sadly, is that we don't own the land, so we're able to focus more readily where we do have control of the land. So, for example, in Overton and Whitchurch, we've got some car parks that we're able to kind of investigate in more detail the opportunities there to introduce EV chargers. But with Brighton Hill and Tadley. I think that those are in private ownership, so a little bit more. That's a little bit more difficult to achieve. Certainly, there, there will be scope there to to work with the the landowners to see if they would be interested and willing to to bring forward EV charges, because I'm sure it would attract customers to those those locations, as you say. Councillor Vaux. Um, thank you, Chair. Just in, in response to the uh, mention of Tadley, um, yes, Tadley would like more um, electric charging points. Um, that there, there, I think I can't remember how many there is. I know that there's at least one, but I particularly wanted to mention about the community centre because um, the community centre would like to have um, electric charging, charging points, but actually it's the cost for them. Um, the business case of it doesn't quite stack up. So if um, it's possible for us as a council to talk to organisations like the community centre who would contribute, but I don't think can afford the whole cost, um, I think that would be very beneficial. I'm, I'm sure that's something we can help to advise to see if there are funding opportunities from elsewhere. For, from time to time, the government makes grants available. So I'll ask a colleague to look into that and perhaps get in touch with you um, for the community centre. Yeah, okay, that would be go. fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Carruthers. Hi, um, just in response to Councillor McCormick, um, again, talking about Hadley, um, we do have some 
electric charging points in Tadley. Um, we're really fortunate that our town council are really proactive um, with um, their, their concerns over climate change and they've actually funded it themselves. So at the moment we, we do have some. Um, I personally would like to see um, something written into planning to say that when um, shops and stores over a certain size um, are, are given permission that, that we're, we're asking them to put in um, charging points as well. Unfortunately, obviously Lidl didn't get approved and that was West Berkshire, but had it been approved you know that would have been an ideal opportunity in Tadley um, for us to put the charging points and I think that that's something we need to look at is not just us supplying them but but putting something into planning to to help get other people to put them in as well. I'm happy to respond to Councillor Crothers chair if that's if you're happy. Yes please. Yes we, we do in our parking SPD actually have some um some requirements now for EV chargers um, as part of commercial um, planning applications, non-residential applications. So we, we don't get that, that many um, planning applications of, those, of that ilk, but when we do now that they are required to make provision for EV chargers, um, particularly for the commercial um, types of planning applications. Obviously the local plan update provides further opportunities down the line to, to make those tougher and more demanding. So that'll be an area that we explore with the with our EPH committee in time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vaux, I've got your hand up. Is it that from last time? I'll assume so. So can I go, go on to Councillor Kinnear, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, could I just make a request is that when the officers speak, could they, each time they speak, could they give their name? Because it's very difficult to go from screen to screen. Um, one thing, uh, Kingsclear, with the Fieldgate Centre, a sporting facility, um, that would be an ideal opportunity to have a charging point. I don't think I've seen any charging points in Kingsclear at all. So I do agree that the rural areas with small shops, sporting, uh, Basingstoke um, and Dean Council, uh, sporting facilities, it would be a very good idea. So please, could that be... Um, I'm just mentioning that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, there's quite a number of uh, questions on transport, which obviously we've not got to yet, but um, so I hope you're taking note of this for that section. Um, can, I, can I just say, going back to uh, the fact that we're looking at uh, pages 51 to 63, um, we've got a comment um, Tackling the Environment and Climate Emergency Meeting, hosted by CEP Committee. Uh, could you give us some details on that and, and just um, let us know about it before, um, you know, so, so we can comment on it? What, uh, what are you asking? Sorry. You are mute, sorry. Sorry, Hayley. Uh, there's a reference on page 56, which states um, there's going to be an annual organised meeting tackling the environment and climate emergency meeting, and it's going to be hosted by the CEP committee. Could you give us some details? It's uh, Mark Lambert here, officer from Basin Stoke and Dean. Just to chip in at that point, that is part of the climate emergency declaration that was made by councillors last summer. And I think by that, what we're intending to do is, is to present an annual report to CEP committee to update on progress to date um, and, to, and to provide further details on work that's been undertaken. I think as part of that, we would like, we would envisage um, public speaking um, from um, interested residents and stakeholders, whilst we will continue to engage with other groups such as the Low Carbon Energy Group. Okay. Uh, Councillor Simon Mahaffey. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to pick up on uh, a comment that the uh, first speaker made about carbon offsetting. Um, I fully agree with what uh, was said about offsets are very 
uh, complex, and I actually have a meeting with uh, Councillor Aegis, Sam and Mark coming up very shortly to discuss this. This is something I was uh, one of the first people in the UK to work on carbon offsets in 1995. And um, I just wanted on record that my view is that in terms of presentation, um, carbon offsets don't sit on a uh, a level um, sort of uh, a, 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 the same level as some of the other five points that we've made. Carbon offsetting should very much be a last resort. It's a question of reducing our carbon uh, carbon output uh, and then offsetting the remainder to the extent that it's possible uh, within the right sort of parameters. So it's just in terms of the next draft of this document, the way I read it at the moment, it says we've got our six um, pillars that we want to focus on and they're all given equal standard. Um, I'd like to see that carbon offsetting is certainly in there, but it's subordinate to the other ones. Uh, do we have a response to that? I think that's the point. It's Mark Lambert, Chair. It's a point that we can note and take away um, in considering comments on this evening with Councillor Reaches. Thank you. Um, I, I've got another question on page 56. Uh, there's a mention as a mention regarding a, a ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles. Uh, has that had any uh, thought put into it? So I, I can quickly pick that up. So that's the um, that's the national. Um, so at the moment, 2035, there is talk of bringing that date forward, but there's a, a national ban on the, the purchase of new petrol and diesel cars uh, or vehicles from 2035. Okay. So I don't have any more uh, hands up for this this particular part. Oh, sorry, Councillor Tilbury. I obviously don't wave vigorously enough, do I? It's... Well, the, problem, the problem is there's so much paperwork to look at and I'm not looking at you, unfortunately. No, it, that's the trouble. You're trying to look at too much at once, isn't it? No, the <laughs> point of it, we are in, we're in danger of going over the same ground we had at the climate panel because a lot of us are on there anyway. But, I mean, we've obviously, for some years, we've been trying to open to get light in one of our borough council-owned car parks, so there's plenty of scope there, Mark, but the problem is getting the power there in the first place for the lighting, but obviously, you know, as we said, well, if we could get light in there, then we could put an EV point in there in an out-of-the-way area where it wouldn't cause problems, whereas if you try to put it in the village centre, you'll have all, it's, it's bad enough trying to get disabled parking, so there is scope for that, but there, it is the, the initial cost is a problem, but... One thing's always great is on page 59, if you look at our sort of council operational emissions, obviously you can see the biggest area is the leisure park, basically, or leisure centres. Well, if you look at that, we were talking about this earlier, obviously, with the ice rink, there's a rather obvious one there where you have the, the aquadrome, which obviously has to use a lot of energy to produce heat, to heat the water and to heat the premises there. And you next door to it virtually, you've got the ice rink where it's trying to produce cold, which it does by, you know, the way a refrigerator works, it dumps loads of hot air, you know, out the back of the thing there, you know, and you, you think there's an obvious synergy there if you could combine the two, which could be done as part of any sort of um, reworking of the leisure park, because it requires them to work together, whereas clearly when they were built, the two were built in isolation. Well, the ice rink was probably built for, oh no, probably Aquadrome, it was re then renovated. But again, you think there's an obvious thing you could do there. You know, it's, it's the sort of thing we did years ago in this country, you know, Battersea Power Station used to power, power out of Pimlico with pipes that went under the Thames into the big council estates and heated them all up. And even after they shut Battersea down, they built a big gas plant there to replace it to, for a district heating scheme. And these are the sort of things we sort of really need to look at now because too often these things are done in isolation and no one thinks about, you know, you know, you've got one, one generating heat and the other one using it. And they're, you know, it is, most of the of it from one is just being wasted it literally into the air, warming the environment up, making the problem even worse. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we could possibly do there, although, you know, we are the owner of the park, you know, even if we're not necessarily going to redevelop it. So those are the sort of things that, you know, we need to pressure the develop new river or whoever to, to do. So, yeah, thanks, Chair. You're welcome. Uh, do, do we have a response to that? 
Um, yes, Chair, it's Mark Lambert. Just to confirm that Councillor Tilbury is absolutely right. These are the types of uses where we would look for a comprehensive solution these days so that we don't miss out on opportunities like this. And I would imagine with one single developer bringing that site forward in, in the future, there'll be opportunities for, for, for a combined heat and power plant that, that satisfies needs and doesn't, it doesn't waste energy in the way that um, Councillor Tilbury described. Um, I've got a question on that. I mean, basically, when I read this report, I see it very much as a, this is what we're going to do. It, there's not, I mean, there's detail in it, but not that level of detail. So, so when do we plan to go into that level of detail where we're going to start to, um, you know, use energy made in one place and put it in another one? And I know Councillor Mahaffey's uh, recently been talking about uh, many down and making that carbon positive, uh, for example. Um, when are we going to go into that level of detail? But I think that's the point, isn't it? That this is a framework and a strategy. So it's the start of it and it's the introduction to it and then everything else sits behind that. So when we pick up a big project, we will be dealing with that, making the policies, going into all that detail. Um, this is the framework that says this is our intentions and then we've got to pick up the big projects and get that ambition and all work together in that respect. I don't know if Mark or Sam want to... Disagree or agree with that? Sorry, Sam. Sam Taylor here. Happy to, to come in. So I think um, there are there are areas where we already have a, a reasonable level of, of, of detail, and there are there are areas within the action plan set out that that start talking about exactly what we're going to do. You know, the expected costs and, and benefits in terms of carbon reduction as a result of that, um, and that's where we have a good feel. At the same time, there's an acknowledgement that. That there's actions that will take a long time to develop and you know we just talked about the leisure park that's a perfect example where that's a long a long-term project working with a, a development partner where conversations are already happening but that that'll take a while till we have a detailed you know get down the line of someone doing, doing a specification and a mechanical uh, drawing and design of exactly what that look but those um so this strategy is always setting out, you know, how we want to approach those frameworks and within the action plan, acknowledging that that's something that we need to deal with. Um, but those details are, are, not, are not there yet, which is why we intend to bring this every year to, to see EP to update on what we've done, progress that's been made, um, and then an update on actions that we expect to implement moving forward. Thank you. Um, I, th I think uh, I have a concern, and I think Council McCormick has a the same sort of concern that there's certain, certain um, potential projects, and the ice rink is one of them, that if we don't uh, get in an early stage and put this design in place, then it won't get captured because we'll, we'll go down, a, I mean, we're gonna get a spec in, by Christmas, hopefully, that spec won't have this detail in. And then we're gonna start work, and then there's no way we can possibly get it in. So, so what, I mean, it's not criticism in any way, because this is potentially a massive job and you could employ lots of people just doing this job, but we need to pick up on certain things and get them involved or get them moving. And, and I, I just don't know, but it's just a question really, have we thought about how we, how we do that sort of level of implement, implementation? It's, uh, it's Mark Lambert, Chair. It's, it's really, a, I suppose it's across the board. What we've been doing is mainstreaming climate change as much as we can amongst officers and members. So members of SMB and Cabinet more generally are very um, attuned to, to issues around climate change. Uh, when reports come to councillors now, they have a section in there which relates to climate change, um, which Sam generally comments on uh, to ensure that they're, they're, they're taking account of issues linked to carbon emissions. Um, and that, that there's a checklist behind that. So we're really trying to embed this in as many areas as we can. The, obviously the, the officer delivery group um, as kind of projects and has the scope to discuss them in more detail, as does the members advisory panel. So I wanted to offer some reassurance that we, we do cover these things amongst officers, um, senior officers and amongst members. So um, I think we've, we've hopefully got that, that kind of thing covered. And as Sam said, we'll bring detailed issues uh, to the attention of members as, as they rise. Okay, thank you. Sorry, just to echo that, that kind of collaboration has already been at the heart of, of producing this document. So with, with the work of consultants, WSP ourselves, that, that work wasn't a 
you know, a siloed piece of work of here's what you could do in theory. It was very much engaging with officers across the organisation already, uh, in, including you know, officers looking at the leisure park, including um, yeah, you know, our, our operational fleet, all, all these kind of things to make sure. Well, what what can you do, and what's applicable for you guys as based the Dean, Borough Council, and within the borough. So, so collaboration is always very much at the heart of of the pre preparation of the strategy. Yeah. Does Basingstoke and Dean have plans to um, sub this out to a contractor to, to implement a lot of these schemes? Sorry, in terms of the, the action set out in the in the action plan? Well, not so much the action plan. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's probably unfair to bring this up because, it, like I said, this is a concept document in my mind. But if we have a scheme such as Many Down, we want to make that carbon positive. Are we going to employ somebody to push that forward, or are we expecting to do that with just with officers? I think it's probably fair to say that there's a there's a mix. You know, there's going to be actions that that we are going to implement. Um, that there's going to be actions that that we implement as part of the as the climate change team, so to speak. Um, a lot of actions are going to be delivered by teams across the council already. Um, you know, whether that's uh, yeah, you know, so, so for example, I, I, I use the description of the operational fleet a second ago you know the ops team are going to be looking at um low carbon alternatives of vehicles and they're going to be the ones actually procuring and using those vehicles albeit we'll be connecting the dots there'll be i expect um actions here that are going to need further support from external organizations in, in development um you reference many down and and you could we could probably have a it took a long time about something like many down but i think already you know we, we are a, as a partnership as, as it is um involving an external private sector developer um that we can obviously influence as part of the part of the ongoing development i, I expect as part of that that yeah lots of uh, different types of expertise would be brought in to deliver some of these things as with some of the actions that we've we've outlined or, or expect to develop moving forward okay thank you uh councillor vox i've still got your hand up did you want to speak Oh yes, please, Chair. Um, I'm just. Uh, I just want to check on the page numbering. Are are we okay to talk about the action plan? Is, was that in your? Uh, we're going to move on to um, the action plan. Is it okay if I ask a question about that? Uh, I think. Uh, well, can I first of all ask is, if there's any more questions or, or up to page sixty-four? I don't see anyone. So yes, please, uh, Councillor Vaux. Um, I was just picking up on something that Sam Taylor said about some some of these areas have got quite a lot of um, plans or thinking behind them already and others um, are sort of at ground zero and, and, and need to be built up. So I was just looking on page um, 76 at the action plan around buildings um, and recognising that um, some of our leisure facilities such as uh, Tadley uh, Pool and, and Gym um, it must be a really high consumer of energy. And I just wondered if um, there had been any thoughts yet on how we might be able to um, address emissions reduction for that. Do, do we have a response to that apart from uh, cold swims? Hi, Sam, Sam Taylor again. Yeah, I, I can um, have a quick response. Um, I think it's fair to say at an early stage of discussions. Um, the leisure facilities are, are an, an interesting example. But it's something that we haven't always recorded in our own footprint before. Um, because obviously we outsource the operation of the leisure facilities. So there's a um, there's an element to how much we control uh, and work in partnership, obviously, in terms of this operation. Um, internal discussions have, have begun to happen. And I know that the contract is up, for, uh, I think, uh, up for renewal in due course. And, and I think expect that that might be an opportunity to, for further discussions. We as building owners, um, I would expect would want to look at what we can do to the fabric of the building and how we how we incorporate any savings in terms of of, of ongoing costs. Um, but I think it's fair to say that, that there's a lot of opportunity there. And it's, uh, you know, as, as I think councillor I think it's councillor Tilby raised, there's a huge emitter, so there's a real opportunity both with Tadley as an existing building and then obviously the, the Aquadrome as part of the redevelopment to make big savings there. Um, but but an early stage at, the, at this stage at the moment. Okay, thanks. I mean, one of the things to think about is uh, they have massive boilers 
um, which, which keep the, the swimming pools going. So I, I'm pretty sure that there would be um, more effective ways of, of running heat uh, into the pools and stuff. But yeah, thanks very much. Do we have any more questions on page 64, action by all? So we'll move on to uh, buildings on page 65. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Tilbury, saw you straight away. <laughs> yeah, when the, well, the obvious one is, well, we got, it's got the quote on there from Councillor Rizzard about um, we'll be at the forefront. Well, of course, you know, we've been just talking about many then. We've just agreed a large planning application of three and a half thousand houses where there is no provision for any sort of solar heating, anything like that on there. And yet we were building estates in my village 15 years ago, you know, and Councillor Regan was a portfolio holder. He remembers Foxstone very well, you know, but, you know, but the point was we own the land. We decided to do it. We made the developers do it. No, we've entered into a partnership where we are now left seeking to influence them, I think is the phrase that's used. And we haven't got a lot of influence. We're in a 50-50 partnership. So it's going to be very difficult to do this at a time when we should be much more attuned to this sort of thing. So... I don't know where we're going to uh, achieve these sort of things now because we've missed the boat with that one now. And we're sort of suggesting it may be carbon neutral on many down south, but that's a long way down the road. You know, I mean, we're, we're well behind the curve with this one. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've got uh, Councillor Mahaffey uh, raised his hands, and I know he's been involved in many down. So I'd, uh, can I just can I ask him to speak now? Thank you, Chair. It wasn't actually about many down. It was about buildings in general and, and the planning process. But I do take uh, the point that Councillor Tilbury has just made. One of the things that um, strikes me is that uh, the National Planning, uh, the MPPF, um, uh, I paraphrase, says something along the lines of presumption of development, uh, pr presumption in favour of sustainable development. Um, now, there's various different interpretations of what sustainable means. And I think this is our opportunity to make the biggest uh, impact on our future, present and future carbon emissions, um, simply by laying down what we define sustainable to be within the context of Basingstoke, because I think it would make uh, a considerable difference in the type of planning proposals that come forward um, if exactly as Councillor, Taylor, uh, Councillor Tilbury says, you know, one of the requirements is that we look favorably on um, solar panels on the roof. Now, there's a lot of things like passive house design uh, that we could go down the discussions of, but I think we need a local definition of what we understand sustainable to be um, so that we can drive our planning uh, policy rather than be subject to um, letting it drive us. So so before we answer that, I mean, can we, can we sort of um, group it and sort of say, well, the 3,000 houses, the planning has gone through, how do we implement some sort of uh, strategy to those 3,000 houses, or have we missed the boat with that? Chair, yeah, just pick, just coming in there, Mark Lambert. Um, I think what the, the, the many down planning applications obviously been assessed against the local plan standards, the adopted local plan, and we're now at the stage of commencing a local plan update. So picking up on some of the points that Councillor Mahaffey was was making. I think this is a really good opportunity now to be thinking about where we want to be going in the future. Um, my colleague in the planning policy team, Joanne Bromley, is um, about to commission some work to look at this area in a bit more detail to see what we can achieve in the future. Councillor Fell is also keen that we um, look at any, any interim solutions between now and the local plan update being adopted in time. Um, I believe there was some discussion of this at EPH committee earlier this month. So that, that kind of work area is in hand and something that, that the officers are looking at. Yeah, if I can just say, I think that's right. We haven't, you know, the work is ongoing and the, and the planning is only the um, initial planning application at the moment. And we have got the many down standard, which we're working to. So we're not forgetting many down and we see this as a big opportunity and going to do all that we can in respect of that. Oh, you're on mute, Paul. Chair, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, I, th I think my, my concern is um, that uh, when I took over as chair on this committee, 
the first meeting we had, uh, we had a fantastic conversation and Councillor Mahaffey mentioned carbon positive for, for many down. Uh, that, that was over 12 months ago. Uh, we are discussing it. I know we're moving forward with it, but um, have we missed the boat for many down uh, to become carbon positive or certainly the first 3000 houses? But the detailed planning application hasn't been finalised yet, so I think the work's still there. I mean, well, I, mean I don't think we've taken okay. the Chair, can I, can I come back on this? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm very grateful for you you're focusing on the money down issue, but as Councillor Reid just said, we have to look at the, uh, the planning uh, application when it comes in. But the main point I was trying to make was we are constrained by national planning policy. The one thing where I think there is a little bit of flexibility that we can exert local uh, influence is over this term sustainable, because it's not very well defined. I know where it originally came from, uh, but it's, it's variously defined and it's always the last point on any uh, planning application. If we could determine what we understand to be sustainable, and I'm not sort of suggesting any criteria at the moment, but if we understand that, then we can uh, we can influence the planning applications that come forward. Okay, so uh, Councillor Each, uh, have you got any suggestions on how we do that? I do think, Chair, it's probably worth bearing in mind that we have to judge planning applications against the, the local plan that's adopted in the context of national guidance that, that surround us. Um, it's, I, I'm not sure this is the right committee to be talking in too much detail about this with respect because it's it's a matter that Councillor Fell looks after. Um, and I suppose it goes back to the point that Councillor Reach has made around this being a, being a framework type document with more detailed issues being looked at by specific committees and, and officers. And this, this, the, the local plan and all of this green agenda and, and the, this report in, in a form is going to EPH so it can be looked at in more detail so things like many down are going to be discussed in that much more detail and there is lots of work going on in the background in that regard. Okay I think what I was trying to achieve was uh, do, do we have a, a way forward through the council to to get these schemes implemented and I think you, you, you've answered that. Uh, well absolutely there's work ongoing we've got a portfolio holder in council of affair that's all over that we've you know we've got the eph committee that's all over it we've got officers that are dealing with it and you know i'm confident that it's not something that's just been swept under the carpet and it's been the, the issue of many downs being to the map as well so you know that's all been discussed and it's not just been forgotten excellent thank you have we got any more questions oh sorry council andrew mccormick You're on mute. Councillor McCormick, you're on mute. Okay, I, I had unmuted it and someone obviously remuted it. Um, it's a really great aspiration uh, that we have um, domestic properties and looking to tackle local fuel poverty. Um, I'm just wondering whether there's anything, I mean, there, there's things there about shift to low carbon heating, heat pumps, district heating, future technologies, um, solar panels. Um, there is one slight fine ointment in the number of trees that there are dotted around Basingstoke, especially on our outlying estates. If you, if you take a look across Basingstoke, you'll see more trees than there are buildings. Um, the trees have grown very big in the last few years. That will mean that trees to the south of properties are going to impede their ability to have um, solar power for electricity and hot water. Um, I just put a marker down there. Has, has that been thought about from a policy initiative? Because I, I don't think we'd want to chop down a load of trees. We might want to coppice trees or pollard them or something like that. But um, also these new technologies are going to be very expensive. So what kind of, I mean, the mention is made of grants, but um, I should imagine we'll be looking at getting some government funding in to try and um, make sure that we do have some meaningful, you know, help to give to homeowners and uh, people who are renting who want to get these things you know, when you talk about big ticket items costing several thousand pounds, how are they going to afford it? If we just sit back and wait for people to buy it, we'll, 
we're not going to be carbon neutral as a borough by 2030. Does anybody want to respond to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll chip in there. I might ask Sam to pick up on the on the Green Grants Fund, if that's okay. But I'll, I'll certainly pick up the um, Councillor McCormick's point around solar panels and trees and the like. Obviously, when, when, a, when, a, when a large site comes forward as a planning application, um, the developers will be looking at the design aspects of that to make sure that um, it works as a place, and is a, is a good place to live and is, is well designed in that regard. But they'll also look at issues around orientation of buildings to make use of natural light um, where appropriate to, whilst taking into account overheating and the like. So I think solar panels, overheating will be all part of the mix when the site is looked at in detail for larger planning, for larger schemes coming forwards. Obviously, when it's a, an individual's existing house, that will be a matter that they would need to consider themselves um, in bringing forward solar panels. They may, may wish to explore whether that's the best option for them. I'm conscious the government recently uh, launched some green grants to support improvements to homeowners' properties. And maybe I think Sam may be a little bit more up to speed on that than I am. So, Sam, if you're able to, to chip in. Uh, sorry, before you do, Sam, uh, we're approaching half past nine, which is two and a half hours into the meeting. Is everybody happy to continue? Okay, I don't see anyone nodding. So, thanks, Sam. No problem. Um, I think Councillor McCormick raises a really uh, valid challenge, and I think we are not. You know, this is not a unique challenge to base the in the issue of of decarbonising heat, particularly, um, well, both domestically and actually in, in industrial uses, is, is a uh, kind of a head scratcher for lots of people. The technology is there, but how do we how do we get people to do it when it when ultimately there's a significant outlay to lots of these things? I think there is there are schemes that already exist. Um, particularly government schemes. So there's the, the renewable heat incentive. Um, at the moment, that offers uh, no help to kind of upfront costs, but it does pay people money on, a, on an ongoing basis for, a, for up to seven years. Um, there is now, uh, that's going to actually be re replaced in the future by a, a kind of grant voucher scheme. Uh, at the end of this month, the government's new Green Homes grant um, launches, which again is a, a voucher scheme uh, that uh, does include things like insulation um, and low carbon heating, so heat pumps in particular. Uh, that actually is already information that people um, can start to look at what, how they apply and eligibility. So a big part, I think, this is the kind of inspire piece. You know how we how we um, point people in the right direction. Certainly in the in the short term, you know, leveraging the funding that already exists because. Um, because yeah, people don't have limitless pots of money that they can invest in these things. Um, moving forward, then it's looking at how is there anything that we can can do support as a council? Um, and this is why this is kind of a long term strategy. But is there anything else we can do um, to to support either through um, incentives or whatever it might be that exist elsewhere? Um, uh, I know private sector support. Who knows? Uh, I think it's fair to say that that, that is a, a question mark that we would look to. Um, to answer in due course but at the moment it's certainly a let, let's make the most of what is out there um, support support and signpost um, residents to, to those um, those pots of money they can access hopefully that, that addresses the immediate term thank you uh, councillor regan got you next councillor regan come back yeah can you hear me yeah, we can hear you. When are we going to talk about buses? Um, I think that's um, next. In fact, if there's no more questions on uh, buildings, shall we shall we go on to transport? Yes, I mean, everybody talks about cars, and it's quite important because it, everybody drives, except a few of us who can't. Um, who wish we could. Uh, but one of it, the concerns me is that the... Transport Act still prevents councils from running their own bus services. So it's relying on the private sector and actually the county council to subsidise uh, uneconomic un routes, as it's called. Uh, and, but the council are county council are cutting back on the uh, on the subsidies. So there is a role for the borough council, which it has taken up quite a bit. But it worries me that the big estates being built, like Manny Down uh, and the others, uh, with no plan for bus services. Uh, 
it might have cycle routes, but there are no bus bus routes, etc. So until you tackle the issue of a regular cheap uh, bus service, nobody's going to get out of their car. No one in the right mind is never going to get out of their car, and that's from the experience. So. It's all, right, it's all right, my my own estate has a regular commercial bus service because there's lots of people who don't drive. But if you want to, if you want to tackle climate change and carbon, you're going to have to have electric uh, buses and a, and a good transport system, which we have not got. Just left to the vagaries of, of stagecoach. That's my point. Thank you. Can I hand that over to... Uh... Councillor Eaches or officers? I'm happy to chip in the chair. It's Mark Lambert again. Um, just in terms of major planning applications, um, as members will be aware, there's generally a section 106 um, legal agreement attached to, to that, which sets out the planning obligations placed upon the developers, developers to mitigate the impacts of that development. That will generally, for schemes of above a certain size and scale, require them to, to either fund or directly provide a bus service. So in the case of some of these schemes um, to the north of Chinham, the Razors Farm, Upper Cufford Farm, we're seeing um, bus services currently being, being designed up uh, to service those developments. And that will be the case with, with many down in time. Um, the 106 is still being negotiated, but I'm sure that the, service, the provision of a bus service will be a key element of that. We recognise bus services need to be in early and, and as soon as possible to service new, uh, new residents before they establish travel patterns based around the car. So that, that's a key issue that um, we are tuned to, as well as the County Council. And I suppose looking longer term, we've got aspirations for, for, for an MRT, a mass rapid transit across the town, serving key locations with fast frequent services with dedicated infrastructure. So again, there's some reassurance there that, that, that those kind of issues are in hand and are picked up through the planning process. Next. I can come back on that. Yeah, sure. But it's still left to favour as a private enterprise, isn't it? I mean, unless that section 106 money is going to run out. It's not like a, an actual plan as such. I mean, until you have state-run or publicly owned uh, transport systems, which are not left to uh, cutbacks, I mean, the section 106 money only funds like the number four bus for, for the South Southam to the hospital. Uh, that only runs hourly. And uh, so that's what happens with subsidised bus services in early and don't run on Sundays. So what are people going to do on a Sunday when they go and see their grandma? Well, they get in a car. So we're still dep highly dependent. All developments are still highly dependent on cars. So that's until that's tackled, we will never tackle, uh, make any headroad into uh, climate change. You've got to have a, a complete cultural change. That's my thoughts. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Cousins. Thank you, Chair. Certainly transport is going to be one of the key things that we need to unpack and improve going forward. Um, and clearly, Councillor Regan is right. Electric buses is certainly one thing that we need to make sure that we bring on board and we try and bring on board pretty quickly. There are other things that I think we should be considering and I think the mass transport system is potentially pointing to them, but I just want to make sure that they're sort of on the list of considerations. So as much as we've got park and ride, or we should want to keep park and ride, we should also be ambitious for things like park and stride and park and pedal, whether people bring their own bikes or whether there is the option to rent a bike similar to um, rentable bikes in other towns and cities across the country and likewise with the e-scooter trial we should wait and see what that feedback looks like in terms of renting um, e-scooters and other forms of e -mo micro mobility and e-mobility in terms of putting that forward. Um, we've talked previously around uh, charging points and certainly in my ward um, trying to resolve the quandary that is on-street residential parking for the oncoming prospect of EVs is something that we're going to have to get to grips with and we need to do that sooner rather than later because it's not just something specific in my ward there are several other wards where we need to try and resolve this issue 
um, where there is inadequate to no off street or on street parking that we have to try and get this issue resolved with. Bringing in something that Councillor Beerman, well, former councillor and former mayor <laughs> Martin Beerman spoke about earlier, which is actually a good point, is if we're still putting in the prospect of a car provision for a new chief exec, maybe we should mandate it that it be an e-vehicle. Maybe we should mandate it that it is an electric car that they have to pick if we want to do these things and lead by example. And likewise, are we looking at things, uh, looking at the uh, action plan HR policies? Are we looking at things like um, salary sacrifices for EVs and e-bikes and other forms of mobility to try and help people either move out of combustion engine into electric or out of vehicles, cars altogether and onto alternative modes? Thank you. Chair, would you like me to, to, to respond to Councillor Cousins' comments? I think the, the things that um, Councillor Cousins raised there are all on, all on the agenda that officers are talking about frequently. So again, th th those are things that we, we, we're keen to pursue, particularly things around um, improvements for the MRT, park and ride, e-scooters, that kind of thing, very much things we, we'd like to explore in more detail. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, HR type policies. I'm I'm not that familiar with with the work that's going on, but I understand that the, the team have commenced work around pay and benefits, uh, and that has got quite a broad spread, including um, rewards for use of cars and that kind of thing. Whilst trying 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 to encourage um, alternative modes, um, there's some separate work being undertaken around smarter ways of working, which is also going to touch on travel planning um, and encouraging staff to travel to the council by alternative modes. But I think. We're not at the stage of undertaking survey work right now, given given the unusual travel patterns of, of us all right now. Thank you. Um, I don't seem to have any more hands up at the moment. I've got Councillor Regan, your hand still up. I don't know if you want to ask, ask another question. No, it's got stuck. I, I, I'll undo it. No worries. OK, can we move on to uh, zero carbon electricity on page 67, please? Uh, Councillor Still, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. It's actually just a comment, um, seeing as this is going on for a little while. I just actually would like to say a huge thank you to the officers and the portfolio holder um, a huge amount of work has gone into this draft report and of course the work is ongoing. I just wanted to make that clear and just to say a big thank you to them because there has been an awful lot of work that's gone into this draft report. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Still. I think I think everybody appreciates it and um, you know it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great uh, position we are in as a council to be moving this forward so um, uh, can I just echo uh, Councillor Still's um, thoughts do we have any comments on um zero carbon electricity see anybody so I'll move on to waste and consumption no comments okay uh, natural environment really? <laughs> jack's waving away <laughs> So I thought we got away with that then. I saw it. No that. chance. <laughs> no chance. Sorry. Sorry. Um <laughs> sorry, I Jack. think I think the portfolio holder knows where I'm going with this. Um, I know. I was only when he moved on, I could see you frantically waving that thought. Well, I better no, not pretend I, I've I, not I, seen I, that. <laughs> I, I just want to reiterate, as I always do the ongoing food waste debate that we have. It's good that it's still on the agenda and that we're still looking at it. And likewise, as I've always said, any help that I can give the portfolio holder to help convince people otherwise, or, you know, if it's a case of, you know, we need to see what other changes we can make elsewhere, look, if there's anything we can do, let's just try and get no, on and do absolutely. it. And I, know, and I know we've had previous discussions in the past where it's a wider ranging thing that we need to try and balance. 
Um, but by the same token, uh, even central government is sort of pointing everybody in the direction of we've got to do this at some point. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think things have moved on from when we were tendering the contract. And, you know, I, I, I still am of the view that I don't see the benefit of a food collection when we've still got a weekly waste collection, food waste collection. But things have definitely moved on in the, at the moment. And I think I said that it council or another committee recently. So at the moment, the Hampshire Waste Partnership are um, doing a piece of work. So Project Integra, sorry, not the Hampshire Waste Partnership, Project Integra are doing with County a big piece of work because when the government first started looking at mandating food waste a little while ago and the consultations were going out, it was a bit of, well, you know, each authority would have to look at it on its own. But I think now that it's becoming more and more likely that it will become mandated, even though we've all got our own contracts, county do do the dispose, you know, they do, we collect it, they dispose of it. So there is all this work going on around how would that work if we did that as a whole Hampshire with them collecting alongside others. So that's coming hopefully back to Project Integra in October time, ready for the government to make some more solid decisions early next year, which will then guide us and it will guide us in a lot of things to do with waste and you know, I, I know I keep saying coming back, but then COVID happened and the government have yeah. denied it. But things are moving a lot more quicker. And I think things have changed. I think ever since councils have started declaring climate emergencies, I think people's thinking around waste has changed, but in a good way. And that these conversations and these more difficult conversations, I think they will start coming to the fore again by the end of this year early next year and certainly the papers that will go to pi hopefully in october will all be public papers that you can easily find or i can share with the committee and things and that'd be good i suppose the only other thing to mention is the task and finish group we've got for trying to improve the recycling rates for flatted developments um we've had one meeting of the um of the map sorry um and we do need to meet again and see no, absolutely. what other things I we agree. can I do think but we, likewise yeah. you know if there's more stuff coming out that we should perhaps hold on hold back with and wait until that's available we should do that but certainly that should be also central in terms of getting a way through and improving uh, the waste and recycling or reducing the waste limit and improving the recycling rate yeah, no, no, absolutely. I agree. And I think you're right. I think we, we had a really good meeting, actually. I remember it about the flats and it was, you know, cross party. It was really productive um, and quite a good evening talking about that. But it somehow has lost its momentum. The work is still ongoing with officers, but then other things have happened. But I have my regular waste meeting tomorrow with the team and um, with Rebecca. So, um one of them may be listening now, I might, I'll just get that added to the agenda for the morning, just um, so that we can just find out what happens, because we all now know that these virtual meetings can work. So, you know, even if we can get our flat group back together on a Teams meeting, then uh, I've got no objection to that and think it might be helpful. So, yeah, let me find out what the pros and cons of having that meeting are now, or whether we need to wait until we get some other information. And I'll definitely come back to you offline on that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I've just got um, uh, Councillor McCormick uh, on this subject and then I'll move on to natural environment and offsetting. Thank you, Chair. It's great to see we've got a commitment on page 68 to a, I don't know if you can see that with my camera, um, the end of trash, a circular economy, uh, reusing everything that we make. Um, it would be good to have a little bit more uh, detail on that um, in the um, residents facing documents that you know that is our aim basically we want to reduce our waste to zero and have a circular economy whether we'll do that or not in the next 10 years is another matter but we should be well on the way to doing it um, because the amount of waste we chuck out you know single-use plastics and things is absolutely appalling Thank you. Shall we move on to uh, natural environment and offsetting? Anybody? Okay, so um, so that's most of that finished. Has anyone got any more questions on the general document? Can't see anybody. 
So, um, so it's basically up to the uh, committee to note the work undertaken to date, um, including the establishment of a member's advisory panel and an officer delivery board and, a and the commission of uh, WSP to support the Borough Council and provide um, comments on the draft climate uh, change. Well, we we we've done that. Air quality strategy at, for consideration by the cabinet members for the environment enforcement uh, prior to consultation. So thanks everybody for the contributions to that. Move on to item 10, uh, which is the Community Environment Partnerships Work Programme. At the last meeting, the committee asked when the updates, care leavers and corporate parenting uh, could be brought back to the committee. Officers have, have advised that following the report to CEP in January, the council has, have, has continued to provide the support outlined in the report and to work with Hampshire County Council and other districts. A corporate office, officer working group has been established. The group and implementation of an action plan to extend the support available has been delayed by COVID, specifically the transfer of staff to the community hub. It is therefore proposed that uh, to report to CEP in spring summer 2021 to allow the working group to progress identified actions. So the, so the work program we've got lined up. Uh, so the next meeting we've got is the 21st of October. Uh, we, uh, the first, well, the only agenda item we've got listed is the Hampshire Together Modernising Our Hospital and Health in Infrastructure. Uh, this is uh, an update on Hampshire's Hospital Foundation Trust preparation of a business case for a new hospital and other improvements. Uh, and that's, um, that's by Council Bound. Uh, we've also got, well, we've not got it listed here. Uh, but we need an update on the ice rink. I think we identified that today and uh, a, a further update on the football club. So, uh, so we'll put that into the uh, agenda for October the 21st. Uh, items to be timetabled. We've got the Be Love review and update, and that's the cabinet member for communities, culture and partnerships and the Curl Leavers and corporate parenting update. And that's the, the cabinet member for homes and families. So uh, move on to uh, current and planned working groups. Uh, we have the CCG task and finish group uh, to review and gather evidence of impacts of, G of GP mergers and the reshaping of GP uh, services to better appreciate our residents' concerns and issues. So uh, an update. Um, officers have con contacted the CCG, but have not yet received a response. And that's probably quite understandable in the current situation. We have another thing for um, recycling from flats and apartments. So we've got to review and ensure that steps are taken to improve recycling rates from its current level and investigate any barriers to maximize recycling potential from flats and apartment blocks. So the group had their first meeting on the 4th of February and were advised of the planned work which would be carried out across the borough to improve the recycling rates. The group agreed to meet again in three to six months and review the timeline of the planned works. I guess we've not got a further meeting planned. So obviously we've had issues, uh, which has uh, scuppered that to, to some extent. And I think that's it. So it's um, 21.52. I apologize to everybody for keeping them late. And I'd like to thank officers. It's been a, a tricky meeting. Uh, I think we have made some progress. I'm not sure where, but certainly in the last item, it seemed a bit more positive. Uh, so I'd like to wish you all uh, farewell and, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair.